And good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen for uh, October 29, 2019. I'd like to call us to order and move to the approval of the minutes for September 27th, 2019. We actually have a couple sets, October 9th and October 15th. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of September 27th, 2019. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I move to approve the minutes of October 9th, 2019. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Make a motion to approve the minutes of October 15th, 2019. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, public comment for items that are, that are not on the agenda this evening. Seeing none, we'll move to the exciting part of the meeting uh, and a little bit bittersweet um, recognition of Marie Harris, a longtime uh, personnel board member. And when I say long time, she started as a child. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, um, you've, you've, you've seen Marie here uh, before several boards of selectmen um, representing the interests of the town in collective bargaining uh, agreements with our negotiating collective, collective bargaining agreements with our, um, our employees. And Marie brought a value of, uh, of the employee experience in Hingham uh, to that role on the personnel board, which is so important, and um, carries um, the responsibility of the Board of Selectmen in, in the town in those negotiations. And I think uh, over the years developed um, rapport and respect uh, both uh, on this side of the table as well as the other side of the table, and that's not an easy task. Uh, so we have so appreciated your work again over these many years in very sensitive and um, extremely important negotiations on behalf of the town. So from a grateful Board of Selectmen, if you'd permit me, I'd like to read our proclamation. On behalf of the Board of Selectmen, this certificate is presented to Marie Harris in recognition of 20 years of valuable contributions to the Hingham Personnel Board. The Board of Selectmen wishes to express our deepest appreciation for your dedication in representing the interests of the town and employees with compassion and fairness. Your wisdom, thoughtfulness, and graceful approach to negotiations will guide the personnel board for years to come. Thank you for your service to our community. Karen A. Johnson, Mary Power, Joe Fisher, Hingham Board of Selectmen, this 29th day of October 2019. Thank you, Marie. Back at the table, right where you belong. Yes. <laughs> you know, before, 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 before you start, before you start, Marie, uh, I, I have, um, I am going to add to the agenda a bylaw provision that says that uh, members of the personnel board have to serve notice on us before they move out of town. So. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I just wanted. It was two years notice. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> two years notice. Okay. But I just wanted to thank everyone. Uh, I am just so grateful to be here, to have been a member of the personnel board for so many years. I have a wonderful group that I've been. Uh, Privileged to work with uh, uh, David Pace, the chair, um, Samira Million, Russell Kahn, and Jack Manning. It's been a good group. We've we've accomplished a lot, and uh, also I, I'd like to remember Nelson Ross, who was a wonderful mentor to all of us, and uh, he he brought so much to the table, and he we we just so appreciated the fact that he was such a good mentor, so very generous and, and kind with his time, and uh, and also I'm, I'm delighted to see David Basil here today. He's uh, he was a very important part of the um, the personnel board's role and he helped us in a, a lot of negotiations and in helping us to get prepared and and also I'd like to thank the selectmen uh, for the great job that you do uh, the countless hours that you spend preparing studying the issues preparing for meetings and uh, and, the, and the employees of the town they do a great job and um, uh, just to keep the residents happy and uh, and it's been wonderful living in Hingham and, and while I'm still a resident I just want to thank everybody and uh, it's, it's, been, it's been great it's been a great run thank you
Thank you. Have served with you. You have Thank been you an all. amazing mentor, <laughs> and we are going to lose a big, big part of it, but you'll always be part of our team. Thank you. I'm going to take a Oh, good idea. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Oh, I'm going to bring that in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Susan, walk us through. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and now on to the the business section of our meeting, um, and we have a presentation from um, uh, Real Estate Council Susan Murphy on the. Um, transfer of land at 230 Beale Street. Real Estate Council slash photographer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just felt like that was a moment that we needed to be captured. So. Going to be an extra assessment for that. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see it on the yeah, we'll see. <laughs> This is in connection with the um, Alliance project that is down on Beale Street near the Stop and Shop, abutting Bear Cove Park. Um, you know, Joe was on the zoning board during that permitting. Uh, Mary and Karen, this came before you, before town meeting, because it was a uh, Warren article, I think in 2018, in order to authorize, the town to authorize the selectmen to accept the deed. Um, so this is a parcel that is at the back end. So you have the development on the, on the front part, and that's where the Hingham Mutual building always was. Then there was a wooded area with a path through it that the employees of Hingham Mutual used to use during their lunch hour, <laughs> whatever, to take walks through the park. And then there was a, a grass area known as the meadow, which most people walking through ba uh, Bear Cove Park never realized oh, wasn't part of the park. There was, it had, if for people who are familiar with it, it had those painted, colorful painted dead trees. So I'm um, back there. So it's, um, art, it's art, Susan. <laughs> yeah, it's art, yes. Um, during the 40B process, it was raised, and it was even raised to the uh, subsidizing agency that this was a, you know, sensitive area and that something should be done with it by the developer in order to conserve, preserve it. Um, and so the, the, both the Board of Selectmen through the Memorandum of Agreement and the Zoning Board through the permitting process worked through a lot of different variations on the best way to protect that land. And in the end, Alliance came forward and said, how about we give it to the town? And so um, that was their offer as opposed to just putting a conservation restriction or other type of way of preserving it. They offered to deed it to the town and make it officially part of the park. Um, and so that was uh, memorialized in the memorandum of agreement as well as the 40B permit. Um, the requirement is that prior to receiving a certificate of occupancy, they need to convey it to the, to the town with clear title. Uh, we've spent a month or two kind of clearing up miscellaneous things in the title. There was a mortgage on it. There was uh, restrictions that were related to their project but shouldn't have affected the parcel. And they've done everything that I asked them to do with respect to um, the title clearing. And so here, here we are. They've signed the deed. Um, the request is that the board vote tonight to accept the deed and to execute it. And then it will go um, in escrow with instructions that they will not record it until they're ready to record all those title clearing documents. Um, but I believe representatives are here and they can talk about timing if you have any questions for them. So are we, um, we will execute that deed tonight and- in Yeah, I have the original okay. here. And, uh, and I'm sorry, do you also have a copy of the escrow agreement or? I am, do so I'm going to give it to them with just a cover letter, which states that I'm delivering it to them as counsel to the town in escrow. Um, and that it may not be recorded until they are prepared to record all the title clearing matters. So it's, it's just a standard uh, escrow letter okay. um, that is typical to real estate transactions. Okay. Um, Joe. Are there any environmental concerns about this parcel that we should be aware of? We're not aware of any um, environmental concerns. The only issues that came up were related to potential um, his, historic issues because it's in an area of potential historic um, and that's part of the reason why it also wanted to be preserved so that it would never be um, you know disturbed for development 
And once <coughs> this deed is signed and transferred, are there any additional obligations on the town that are being triggered by this particular act? No, there is an, there is an easement that is being retained for that pathway that yep. existed historically for, and Hingham, as I said, was used by Hingham Mutual. It's actually being improved with a walkway that was a, um, that Lonnie was involved with in order to make sure it was done in a way that would be, you know, uh, protect the environment there and also would keep people from wandering into the wooded conservation areas. Yep. Uh, and just finally, I just want to thank you because you've done a lot of work on this and uh, the town really benefits from it. So thank you. And thank you for all your work on it on the zone board. <laughs> uh, no, um, you know, this, when the memorandum of understanding came to this board a few years ago, we said we were going to do this. Then we went to town meeting and said we're going to do it, and now we're doing it. <laughs> and, <that> nice? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, um, it's helpful. We knew this was coming. The work's been thorough, and I, I'd add my thanks um, as well. I'm, uh, no, no other questions. Uh, questions or comments from the public at this time? Yes, sir. Could you come to the podium and state your name and address? Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is AJ Alavisos. I'm a development manager with Alliance Residential. Um, I live in South Boston, if that's good enough. Um, we'll let you talk. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, as required by our permit, uh, I'm representing Alliance. Um, I'd like to uh, present a check in the amount of basically uh, half a million dollars to fund improvements at Plymouth uh, River School, um, maintenance of Bear Cove Park, and a signed trailer for the police department. Um, I have the check here. I would like to just ask to approach the stand. This is our favorite part of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Usually we're, we're sending money the other way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mary, I don't know whether you want to say anything about this because you yeah, know you were so part of the board that worked hard. Uh, thank on you. This. Yeah, and, and and first of all, I, I I know Mary will express our gratitude as well, but we do appreciate the support of the development group with respect to these municipal <coughs> needs for the town. Yeah, um, thank you, and and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, Paul Healy and Paul Gannon were on the board at the time as well, and when um, uh, in this agreement. Uh, Alliance agreed to pay the town a uh, million dollars for uh, Plymouth River School um, and then funding for the police department for digital sign trailers and improvements in Bear Cove Park and um, you know it's um, uh, uh, this is very helpful for the town. We're going to talk in a few minutes about all the different capital needs in the town. And when we have um, partnerships and, and things of that nature, it's very helpful. I'd also mention that I, I think there was some funding for, um, for, for Lynchfield as well. And, and this was being paid out in a stage of payments. So this is, this is part of the entire payment. Right. Right. And so I think that the total, the total consideration is well over a million dollars. And the town is very, uh, very grateful for that. Right. Okay. So uh, the the original. Oh, you have to do the vote. So yeah. let's do that right. first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And here's the original deed. Yes. Anybody else from the audience care to make a comment? Raise a question. Okay. Um, I would be ready to accept a motion if my colleagues are so inclined. I, I would just add, you know, from my years on the zoning board working with this developer. Um, it's been um, it's been a real contribution to the town that they've made, uh, not just with the check, but with the, in the entire process. Uh, and so, uh, the town thanks you. This, this is the project that put the town into the uncontested ten percent. Yes. So it it, it was very significant um, in in many ways. Yep. It was, and, and again, you know, I hearken back to the to to Mary and Paul and Paul Gannon because that was a lot of hard work at that time. And um, you know, working together with Alliance, I think, uh, has put the town in a position to then control its you know its neighborhood. And uh, Ted Alexiatis as well. Yeah, he, Ted Alexiatis. He was, he was absolutely a key member of that yep. negotiating team. 
take a motion? Yes. I'll make a motion that the board accept the deed of lot B-1B, a portion of parcel located at 230 Beale Street from Bear Cove Investors, LLC, as authorized pursuant to Article 20 of the 2018 Annual Town Meeting and deliver such deed to the grantor subject to the terms and conditions of the Memorandum of Agreement dated October 27, 2016, as amended June 20, 2017. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thanks so for if being each here. of you would sign, and then Karen, I'm going to notarize your signature. Is this your free act indeed? Yes, it is. Thank you. I think Mary was looking to make sure you weren't eating away your hot yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, wait a minute, why is this doing this? You know, there's another <laughs> signature on the front. Thank you never you. know what Tom Mayo is going to say. Susan, thank you. Thank you, Susan. AJ, thank you. Thanks for being here yes. tonight. Appreciate it. Okay. And since we are at the cusp of our budget season it's that time of year again when we need to kind of set the stage and talk a little bit about um, our finances our uh, long-term planning um, you know it's I, I think it's um, it's so helpful to have a colleague like Mary who uh, is so knowledgeable about the the background and uh, I think can summarize it for all of us because it's an important foundational um, place to understand where we're where we're jumping off from and I think that it is in keeping with the long tradition of the careful management and stewardship of this uh, community so without further ado Mary and also I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to numbers <laughs> so I appreciate I appreciate the board indulging me so um, just as background, and Bob, I think we've got the slides up on the wall. Hopefully those will project well. Um, I'm really here tonight because a couple of weeks ago I got a call from Victor Balterra, the chair of the advisory committee, asking that um, a, a presentation about capital that was, that was put together last year um, be shared again with the advisory committee and, and to the extent possible try to make some updates to it. Um, you know, some of the things have stayed the same, but there is some new information. And um, just by way of context for people, you know, we, we have a lot of capital needs, and that's resulting from assets that are reaching the end of their useful life or that they've reached the end of their useful life. Uh, we have changing demographics in town. We also have things like sea level rise that we're going to be talking about tonight. And for the past few years, we've heard about a lot of capital projects under consideration from Foster School to fire stations to the building that we're in, uh, the harbor, the South Shore Country Club. And we have a lot of master plan efforts underway this year for the town for recreation and affordable housing that could generate additional needs. So this is just a little bit of a backdrop. I'm going to go through some background, our current situation the tax impact of new debt and some conclusions and and you know for Karen and Joe as as I look to take this to the advisory committee on November 12th I also view this as an opportunity to incorporate any of your thoughts and observations and be able to convey to convey those to the advisory committee on on November 12th um, just as background uh, this is this is census data that was from the South Hingham study group meeting but 50% um, of Hingham households have an annual income of less than $100,000 a year. And if you look at the charts on the right-hand side, according to census data, by, by the year 2020, next year, 47% of Hingham households will have members age 65 and older. And, you know, like what we're seeing in the South Shore is that many of our communities are starting to age. And, and Hingham is, Hingham is uh, very much in keeping with that. A statistic that's not up here that has been pretty consistent over time is the percentage of households in Hingham that have children enrolled in the Hingham public school system has been about 25% for many years, and that really hasn't changed. 
So as, as we hear a lot, about, a lot of, about a lot of different things, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that we have a very large population that's over 65, many on a fixed income. And if you look at that annual household income, it also says that many of our neighbors and fellow citizens um, are probably feeling economic pressure uh, as, as they look to continue to stay here in Hingham. Uh, this is hard to read, but what I, and I'm not going to go through the details, but you know, one of the things we talk about a lot is our benchmark communities. And, and where is Hingham relative to benchmark communities? And sometimes, sometimes we take a statistic against our benchmark communities and we sometimes kind of use it as, as a bit of a conclusion. And I want to point out just kind of four things uh, relative to Hingham and our benchmark communities. First of all, if you look at our, tax, our total tax levy, and that's the information on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that there's a yellow bar. Hingham's about halfway down the page. Our tax levy is about $84 million. That's how much we collect from taxes. And on the right-hand side, what it shows is what percentage of our tax base is from residential property taxes, and it's about 89%. So we need to remember that as we're talking about taxes, as we're talking about potentially raising taxes, that 89% of that increase, we're all going to be paying for. You know, we sometimes like to compare ourselves to other communities. And, you know, I would point out that, um, uh, for example, if the community of Needham, if you look on the right-hand side, Needham gets about 77% of their taxes from residential. So they have a more developed commercial base. This is also one of the reasons why our board and, and previous boards have been looking at low impact commercial development, particularly in the South Shore Park. Because right now we have a heavy reliance on residential property taxes to pay for all the services and capital projects that we like to enjoy. Um, on the next page, what you'll see is, um, again, with benchmarking data, there's all kinds of things you can look at. And uh, one of the things I looked at is where is our average single family property tax bill? And out of our benchmark communities, our single family tax bill ranks 11 out of 20. And when we think about the benchmark communities in this 20 town comparison that Marie Harris and the personnel board have used for so long, we kind of always like to be around in the middle. And that's where, and that's where we are with our tax bill. Now, the chart on the right-hand side shows the average tax rate, and ours is $11.81 per $1,000 of assessed value. If you look just purely at our tax rate, we're ranked 17 out of 20. Now, if you look only at that metric, you could conclude, gee, Hingham, Hingham, Hingham might be undertaxing. But I would say that if you look at the average tax bill and the fact that 89% of those taxes are borne by residential property, property owners, again, we need to keep that in mind as we look at funding some of these large capital projects. Uh, and just in terms of our long-term liabilities, we are in a very good place, and this is one of the reasons we're a AAA bond rated community from all three rating agencies. Our pension is over two-thirds funded. We were one of the first communities in the Commonwealth to fund OPEB, which is other post-employment benefits. That's our obligation to pay retiree health care benefits. We're close to 20% funded on that. We are on track to have it funded within 30 years. And every year in our operating budget, we spend, we allocate about a million dollars to fund that liability. When I read about communities and states and companies, that are unable to fulfill their retirement commitments that they've made to their employees. Um, I'm really proud of Hingham and I'm proud of what we're doing here. And you know, Karen was on the board when this started and it was during a very tough time that the town said, we're gonna get serious about OPEB. And here we are 10 years later and we're almost 20% of the way there. Um, our fund balance, which is our rainy day fund, is also very healthy. Um, this is a chart that actually goes back from 1992 all the way to, to 2018. And what you'll notice is in the late 19, before the year 2000, our fund balance was on average about 22 or 23 percent. 
And then in the early 2000s, our fund balance started to erode. And steps were taken by the town. Uh, we did those together. And our fund balance has significantly improved. The dashed line that you see on the chart that begins in 2011 is sort of the new accounting way of looking at fund balance, which is to look at what we call the unassigned fund balance. Some aspects of our rainy day fund are committed to things. So the, the accounting standards board essentially says that money's really not available. So as we look at it, we're, we're now looking at that dashed line. And the gray bars that you see on the screen represent the target that's part of our town financial policy. So you can see that our fund balance level <coughs> is actually higher than the guideline in our financial policy. And as of the end of last fiscal year, we were $6 million in excess of the upper limit. As we start looking at some of these large capital projects, this is an area that we may want to look at in terms of whether we would like to apply some of that excess fund balance to offset some of the cost. I, I would sort of call that tax relief. Um, in the last year, I've heard a lot of comments from people about um, opinions about the town and the degree to which the town has invested in assets. And with Gene Montgomery's help, um, we were able to learn that from 2000 to 2018, we have invested $177 million in town assets, or just under 10% per year. And the, the table on the left-hand side shows what is taxpayer-funded and what is state-funded. About 25% of that $177 million came from the state, either CPC matching funds or money from the MSBA for East School and for the Hingham Middle School. Um, and then the pie chart essentially shows where it falls. Again, because of the state program, about um, uh, just about 60% of our investment over the last 18 years has been on uh, school projects. Uh, we've also invested in CPC. We've invested in municipal facilities. And then we've also, the yellow part of the pie chart is capital outlay. And really, you know, about half of that money is for the schools, about half is for municipal. You know, setting aside the, the, the slices of the pie, I would suggest that spending $10 million on our assets every year um, is, is a good thing. And I think we do invest in our infrastructure here in Hingham. I think we also are at a place where many assets are reaching the end of their useful life at the same time. So it may be that as we look at the next 10 years, we're spending more than $10 million a year. This is just a list of some of the projects that we've spent it on. Schools, a renovation of the library, the DPW facility in Carlson Fields, the high school fields, we purchase land on the harbor, uh, the Affordable Ho Housing Opportunity Fund uh, for our road building program. So as, as you look at that investment, we've tried to really focus on a lot of different aspects of our town infrastructure. So if we talk about our debt for a minute, Hingham has a legal debt margin of $309 million. And, and I equate this to you get a credit card in the mail, and it says, congratulations, as, as it did to my 18-year-old son a few <laughs> weeks ago, congratulations, here is your credit card, and you have a credit limit of like $20,000. Well, you know, I, I would say, OK, just because you have the ability to spend that much money doesn't mean you necessarily should. But from a legal perspective, the town of Hingham could take on $309 million worth of debt if we wanted to. We don't want to. Tom is shaking his head. Right now, we have $61 million in outstanding debt. And we have a financial policy that tells us how much debt we want to carry at any point in time. And that's represented by the black line on that chart. And in 2021, we actually are now below that, blue, that black line, which means that we are below the threshold for our debt policy. So this is a policy that's administered by the advisory committee. 
And that says that as we're looking to take on new debt, we have capacity within our financial policy. If you look at our outstanding debt, our, our outstanding debt, we have two, two pieces of it. The excluded debt, which is a 20-year temporary tax increase, and non-excluded debt. Most of our excluded debt is primarily school projects. And what you can see from the bar chart on the right-hand side is by the year 2029, um, our, a lot of our debt is retired. And again, this is for projects like East Elementary School, uh, Plymouth River and Foster Improvements, the Middle School, the um, High School Athletic Fields. We also have non-excluded debt, which is debt that we pay for in our operating budget. That's a lot of municipal projects. And again, if you look at the red, the red bars on the right-hand side, a great deal of that expires by the year 2029. So this year in our budget, we have an operating budget of uh, about $108 million. And right now in that $108 million budget, we have debt service charges of $5.4 million. So, you know, again, this is, this is a place that hits the operating budget. And what you'll see is out of that $5.4 million, 74% um, of it is for school and school projects. 13% um, of it is for fields and recreation. Uh, fire is uh, about 7%. Public works, 6%. We have debt service on land, and, and then a few other miscellaneous things. Um, again, I think this is evidence that we are investing in our infrastructure. And it would also say to me that as we're looking at as we're looking at new capital projects, we have to be mindful of what we still have to pay for. We still have these bills that we have to pay for. So the current year property tax bill on the average assessed value residential home, and, and Rick Nowland, our assessor, uh, was kind enough to provide some of this information. The average assessed value residential home in Hingham is now $841,000. And interestingly enough, in about the 16 months since I did this presentation, that went up by almost $50,000. And the, so if, if your home is, is assessed at $841,000, your property tax bill in a year is about $10,000. And that's a combination of the tax levy, the excluded debt, and community preservation. And I think it's noteworthy to point out that 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 average tax bill is actually just north of the property tax deduction limit that has taken effect with the changes to, um, uh, you know, to, to our taxes. So now, you know, we, we sometimes used to say, well, gee, if we take on new debt and we raise people's taxes, we're giving them an extra tax deduction. So it's not hitting people's wallets as much as, much as we think. If you look at the average tax bill, if your home is assessed at $841,000 or more, um, you're not going to have the benefit of that deduction. And so now let's talk about what happens if we add some new excluded debt. So remember that when we have excluded debt that's outside of the levy, and that's a 20-year tax increase. And the reason that I'm talking about excluded debt is because if we look at our operating budget, I don't think we have the capacity to absorb a really big capital project without significant cuts to services. Because again, our operating budget can only increase by 2.5% a year. So if we were, for every $10 million in new excluded debt, that adds $100 to a tax bill for the average assessed value home. So if your home is valued at $600,000, your taxes won't, your taxes will maybe go up by $80 if your house is valued at more. So here's a table that I put together that's probably a little easier to look at this. In the first column, you'll see different amounts of new excluded debt. So let's just go down, let's go down to the middle, $40 million. If the town were to add $40 million in new excluded debt, 
for the average assessed value home, your property tax bill in year one would go up by $428. And when we finance capital projects, we do what's called level principal payment, which means that the first year payment is the highest and the year 20 payment is the lowest. So if we look at the average tax bill over 20 years for that $40 million, it's $348. And over 20 years, it's just under $7,000. Now, I would point out that we know that every year our taxes are going to go up by that 2.5% amount, which is about $250 on the average assessed value home. So again, let's just hypothetically say next year the town is going to add $40 million in excluded debt. If I'm an average assessed value property tax holder, my tax bill is going to go up by $250 for the normal stuff plus $428. Now, you know, go down and say, well, we've got a lot of capital needs. So what if we said, gosh, let's, let's, let's try to do a lot of things at once. Let's take out $100 million in debt and do all kinds of projects. That's a $1,000 tax bill increase in one year, plus, again, that 250 So as we're thinking about some of these things, again, let's remember that, <coughs> let's remember the demographics about household income, ages of households in the community, and the fact that 89% of taxes are borne by residential property tax holders. So again, if I think of Needham, if Needham raises their taxes to build, build a new building, whatever it is, their, their commercial property tax owners are going to shoulder 25% of that bill. We don't have that circumstance here in Hingham. And so being mindful of the demographics in Hingham is, uh, I think, pretty important. Um, you know, with interest rates, I won't go into this in detail, but um, our financial advisors are recommending that when we're budgeting long-term capital projects, we should apply a 3.5% interest rate. We know that interest rates are lower than that right now. Every quarter of a point um, saves, again, on the average assessed value home, about, about $16 in year one. So um, certainly the fact that interest rates are lower than 3.5% right now uh, would be helpful. But I'd also suggest that, um, uh, especially as we get into numbers that are in excess of $50 million, the, the tax bill impact is significant whether the interest rate is 3.5% or 3%. Um, what is the what is the town doing? Um, you know, I think we've we've talked about this a little bit. And last year, Karen spearheaded a senior means tested property tax circuit breaker that would um, provide tax relief to to a greater a greater number of our seniors. Uh, for this year, we need to identify a funding source and figure out how to pay for that. Um, but I know this, this board has talked about that being important to us so that we can mitigate the impact of some of these projects. Um, we've talked about identifying town assets that could help defray the cost. The, the, the largest one to me right now is the <coughs> excess unrestricted fund balance of $6 million. But I'd also say that once that money is committed, I mean, I, I think, I think there are a lot of different groups with a lot of different projects kind of eyeing that money. So we have to be thoughtful about, about where it's spent because we can spend it quicker than we can save it. Um, pursuing grant and funding opportunities, exploring public and private partnerships where it makes sense. And then lastly, and you know, Joe's picked up as, as the liaison on this, but evaluating appropriate commercial development. This is the work of the South Hingham Study Group. Um, you know, to the extent that in Hingham, as I like to say, we like, we like really good services, we like nice buildings, and we like low taxes. And so kind of pick any two. Um, diversifying our tax base 
is a helpful way to spread out the tax burden. Uh, but obviously, and as we always do in Hingham, we want to do that with thought and with care and understanding that um, there are a lot of different implications. Um, I'll just show you the, the implication of using excess fund balance. And again, I, I took $50 million because construction costs are, seem to be going up. So let's just say, hypothetically, we took $50 million in new excluded debt, and we said we're going to take five of the $6 million in excess fund balance and apply it to tax relief. And, and let's say we do that over five years, so, so that we're, we're spending a $1 million in the first five years of this project. That would actually reduce the tax impact on the average assessed value home by 24%. So what I would tell you is that's significant. And if you think about the way we finance projects with the debt service being the highest in the first few years, this is essentially very much like what we did with the meals tax revenue when we built the middle school. We essentially said, we're going to take $600,000 of meals tax revenue and use that to pay the bills so that the taxpayer isn't paying that bill. We could do something similar with the excess fund balance. And you know, I, I would suggest that it, it, could, be, uh, it could be significant. Um, as we think about grants, and I think, uh, you know, I think it's also worth mentioning um, the MSBA, which is, you know, the, the town for three years has, has applied to be part of the Massachusetts School Building Authority program for schools. This is bringing some of our state tax dollars into Hingham to help defray the costs of schools. And, you know, I've, I've, I've heard a lot of things like, well, you know, we've, the, the town's been very fortunate to get money from the state for East School and the Middle School. Absolutely. I think we've gotten $38 million from the state for those two schools, and that's terrific. Um, but I just want to show you what, what the MSBA program is worth. And again, we don't, we don't know what the solution is with foster school. We don't know how much it would cost. But let's say hypothetically, um, the project cost is $30 million. If we work with the MSBA, their minimum reimbursement is 35%. So that would defray the cost by $10.5 million. And again, the average taxpayer savings on that, that's, that's $112 that a taxpayer doesn't have to pay in year one for 20 years. If a, if a foster school solution is $50 million, the MSBA reimbursement equates to about $17.5 million or $187 for that, you know, for, for the average assessed taxpayer. So, you know, this, this is why we have been diligent and we appreciate the school committee being a partner on this in applying for the MSBA program for now the third year in a row. And we should hear what our status is. You know, as I look at some of this, I also, I, I see the potential benefit of the MSBA because it says to me, if we're bringing some of our state dollars in here, it probably means that we can take on additional projects that maybe we would have to space out a little bit more than, than we ordinarily would. Because, you know, that first slide I showed with all of the different projects that we have, <coughs> You know, uh, several years ago, people started putting some dollars to those, and I, I don't think those estimates are valid anymore, so I, I didn't want to do that. But if, if you look at all those projects and you add them up, you can get, you can get to $100 million very easily. So this is where being thoughtful about how quickly we move and taking advantage of funding opportunities becomes very important. A um, couple conclusions. You know, um, every Hingham taxpayer pays for capital projects. And um, while we have a lot of different boards and committees that are focused on a particular part of what makes our community so great, I think it's important that we remember all the time that all our constituents are the entire town because we're all sort of in this together. And, and secondly, um, debt's not free money. Um, we pay for most projects over a 20-year period. 
And, um, you know, so as soon as we bond a project, it, it seems like, you know, very, very quickly, we've got six more projects that are queued up and ready to go. And we need to remember that we still have $61 million in debt that we have to pay for. Um, the good news is that we are below the limit of our debt service levels defined in our town financial policy. So if the town were to take on some additional debt, the rating agencies would see that as investment in our infrastructure and uh, you know they I think they would receive that positively similarly we have a lot of debt retiring in 2028 and and remember that as we're entering the FY 21 fiscal year we don't necessarily bond a project until after it's completed so if if town meeting were to approve a capital project next year we may not finance that for two or three years. So the good news is that as debt is retiring, our tax bills are going down. We're creating capacity in our budget. I, I would say, and you know, a, a major capital project, and to me, I mean, the number I'm pulling out is anything over $10 million is really hard to fit in the operating budget. I mean, we, we know we have operating budget pressure. Um, you know, last year we, uh, I mean, we've, we've bought a few fire trucks. We did some of the high school field improvement project. In the past, we, we funded the renovation of the central fire station within the operating budget. But as the cost of these projects goes up and goes north of $10 million, it's just harder to squeeze in. It would be the equivalent of saying, take your basic household budget and now, you know, find $500 to pay every month for the next 20 years. Hard, hard to do. So I would, I would say that if we're going to do any of these major projects, it requires a debt exclusion. And let's be clear, a debt exclusion is a tax increase. And again, one of the things last year as I talked with the different groups that were advancing projects is I said to people, in my opinion, it's Asking, asking somebody if they would like a new building or a new something is one question. That's not the same question as, would you allow me to raise your taxes by X dollars to pay for this new building? I think that we should, we need to be mindful that support for projects doesn't necessarily translate to acceptance or agreement for a tax increase. And that's where it becomes so important to socialize these projects and really consider the taxpayer impact, not just on individual projects, but cumulative. And, and that means that, that we may need to reduce the scope of some projects. We may need to defer some. Uh, and we, need, we may need to say no. And um, uh, th this board has said no a couple of times in the last few years. Uh, not always a popular thing to do. Not always what we'd like, but we are mindful, we are mindful of the taxpayers and that 88% of these projects are funded by taxpayers. Um, excess fund balance can provide some tax relief. And again, I just say that the dollars only go so far. So we need to, to choose how to use them wisely. Um, I, I think the other piece of this as we're looking at capital is that this is a period of time where it's really important for us to live within our operating budget, which means no overrides. Again, you know, the average tax bill goes up by a couple hundred dollars every year. We hear from people that sometimes that's, that's a difficult budget challenge. If we're going to be looking at debt exclusions for capital projects, I, I, I don't think it's advisable at the same time to be asking people to open up their wallet to fund more services as well. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, two other observations, you know, continuing to fund those long-term liabilities, the pension and the OPEB are really important. So again, in the short term, we could say, gosh, we're going to take a few years off and we're going to use that money to pay for some buildings. Um, the rating agencies are going to pay attention to that. And, and frankly, the investment returns we've seen, particularly in the last 10 years, have been significant. And I think we, we all understand that those are obligations that we have 
have made to uh, current and past employees. And then, you know, lastly, and Karen, I know this, this was something last year that, that kind of caught your attention. It, it, it seems like we're kind of entering this period now where, you know, we have everyday capital outlay. You need a, we need a new police car. Um, we need IT for the schools. We need, um, you know, we, we need other stuff like that. And we have about a $2 million capital budget. And every year, or in the past few years, it seems like there have been things that have come along that cost maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars where we say, gosh, we don't want that to eat up a quarter of the capital outlay budget because then we won't be able to buy this everyday stuff that we need. And so, they, and so what's been happening is we've been funding those through a Warren article as opposed to the capital outlay process. So last year, the town hall roof, the high school windows, and I think our board, and again, this is a message I'm going to carry to the advisory committee, the vetting of those warrant articles is not always as rigorous and disciplined as the capital outlay vetting process. And, and that's such a good process, and that committee does such great work. Um, the other thing is that that capital is not counted as capital spending according to the town financial policy. And so that really means that we're spending more money on capital than, than, we're, than, than the target we've set. So <coughs> my view is, if we're going to set a target about capital spending, let's count it all. Count. And I know next year, the, advi the advisory committee reviews its financial policy every three years, and I think, I think it's up next year. And the other piece is that we've been actually trying to accumulate non-excluded debt capacity by budgeting it flat every year. When we have these projects, we're eating away at that. And that may be the right thing to do, but it sort of feels to me as if funding these projects through a Warren article, it's, it's feeling like a little bit of a shortcut. And I'm not, I guess I would just, I think we're always so thoughtful about different things that it, it seems to me that we're kind of at a point where that's either going to become a standard practice or we're going to put some guardrails around it. And I guess what I would advocate is it may be the right thing to do, but let's put some guardrails around it. Let's put some kind of a process around it so that we're, we're, we're being as careful and thoughtful about that spending um, as we can. Um, so uh, I think that's, uh, that's it. Um, well done. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, I'll turn to you. Uh, well, that's, that was an incredible report, uh, informative, and I think reassuring to the town uh, that uh, we have been prudent in exercising our financial responsibilities. Um, and that you've been quite thorough in your review. So, so thank you. Um, I do have a couple questions. Sure. Um, the town just committed to purchase the water company. Yep. How does that play into this? Okay, yeah. So that $300 million debt limit, yes. it doesn't go against it. Right. Because um, there's Massachusetts general law says that when you have an enterprise like the water company that has a revenue stream associated with it, it doesn't count. So it's like a different credit card off to the side. And, it, and so it, it has no impact on this. And, and I know this was explained at town meeting, but what's the impact on the uh, on property tax bills? Zero. Right. right. So the water company will be, again, we will get our water bills. They may look a little bit different, but they the may water have Mary's bills. picture on them. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> the water bills that we pay will fund the water company operations and be funded through the enterprise, yeah, fund. enterprise fund. So no impact on. Right. So, um, if so, the, right, so the reason okay. that it's not part of this presentation is that it doesn't belong part of, to be part of Correct. this presentation. Um, you, you'll see in here, you saw some little footnotes, but the, the country club is not in here because it's a separate entity. The sewer is not in here because it's a separate entity the water company will be a separate entity. Um, you, the report talks about um, our debt. Um, I didn't see a discussion about how often 
we refinance it, how is it, our interest rate set, and how long is the debt obligations that we incur? Yeah, so we typically fund municipal debt for 20 years. And the, the only exceptions are like when we, when we purchased two fire trucks two years ago, we financed those over five years. So um, Tom, in his capacity as the CFO, along with the advisory committee, uh, during the budget process, they look at all the interest rates. And uh, periodically, the town has engaged an advisory committee subcommittee to look at the debt and to make recommendations to the, to the chief financial officer of the town about whether it makes sense to finance. The majority of our long-term debt is at 2% or lower. And, um, and we've actually we've refinanced over the past six or seven years at times to be opportunistic. Um, and again, our credit rating really helps us on that because we are getting access to the lowest rates. And we also refinance um, short-term notes. We can roll right. over short-term debt. And again, um, that has been a conversation with the advisory yep. committee. And to your point, um, we, we've gotten very favorable treatment, not only, uh, not only in terms of interest rates, but also access to capital. Yeah. The short-term rates, are, we're getting debt for, you know, 50 basis point, 80 basis points, so less, less than 1%. So again, Jean Montgomery and her team do a wonderful job at looking to say, do we stay in the short term or do we move into the long term? And that's an ongoing regular part of the review process. I, I remember when I was on the advisory committee about six or seven years ago, the advisory committee actually made a recommendation that while the short term rates were so good, we said, let's lock some of this debt into long-term rates so that we're not, you know, we, 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 we didn't want the town to be sort of in the arbitrage business. Right. Yeah, and, you know, trying to reduce that downside exposure. Um, and Capital Market Advisors is, a, is an important peer to the town. Um, and, you know, like we said, again, during the water company discussions, Capital Market Advisors has been here over the long haul advising us on uh, these kinds of uh, important considerations with respect to the debt side of the uh, of the balance sheet. And uh, as, as we were going through the discussions with the water company and we had discussions with all of the rating agencies, we talked to them about the about all these municipal projects because we said, look, we're, we're not only looking at buying a water company, we're looking at doing these other things. And um, so the the rating agencies through our financial advisors are aware of the possibility of all these projects. Um, the financial markets are prepared. Again, I, I think the real question is um, the speed at which the taxpayers want us to move. Um, that's that's the, the bigger one. So you've, I think you've anticipated one of my questions, which was <coughs> on page eight, uh, we talked talk about our debt of 5.4 million and I was going to ask you, at what, in, what interest rate does that reflect? And it sounds like it's about 2%. Yeah. Um, and I really think your presentation um, highlighted the need to make sure that uh, as we're looking at uh, growth in the town, and I know the master plan committee is looking at it, that we really focus on to the extent that we can do something to help defer the residential burden. Uh, of taxes so you know because yep. the other piece of this that we look at is that the the other place where our tax base can grow is in new growth and you know you know that's a combination of somebody making improvements to their home you know bumping out the back or it's new growth and our new growth forecast for the next five years is about half a million dollars a year because there isn't There's there isn't a lot of growth out. you know the ally uh, mm -hmm. the broadstone bear cove was a big element of new growth sure. They brought in about 400,000 yep. in new growth, but there aren't a lot of those projects. So again, the, the challenge of living within our means over the next five years is, is um, there's going to be a little bit more pressure because we won't have the new growth that we've enjoyed in the last couple of years. And, and new growth, aside from you know, home improvements, I mean, new growth is a little give, give and get, right? Like you, we're, we're getting tax dollars, but we're also having to provide additional services. Yeah. So, um, but you know, to your point, the pie is the pie for the moment. And I think we've got we've to be able to um, share the pie. Yes, oh, that's good. <laughs> Talk about Any other pie. dessert related? <laughs> no, I wish. <laughs> Anything else, Jeff? No. 
Uh, well, Mary, again, really, really well done presentation. Um, uh, you know, I guess w one thing I would point out that I know we all know, uh, but I sort of point out um, for the folks at home uh, is that, you know, the, the financial policy of the advisory committee that Mary referenced has kind of a statement of, of goals. And, and one of the statements that they make in their financial policy is the importance of um, financial diversity in the town of Hingham. So, you know, you could escalate how, you know, home costs, you could escalate your tax base and you would essentially drive away any financial diversity within your, your demographic. And I think it's really important that we've stated as a goal, and it's a financial policy that all of the boards stand behind, um, that, that, that our goal is to preserve, um, is to preserve that yeah. financial diversity within, um, within our population. Um, and so to, to Mary's point, if that is one of your goals, then you do have to come back to the slides on, in the early portions of Mary's presentation that show you the effect on, on an average household um, and, and, and the in income of an average household in Hingham. Um, you know, I, I, again, I, I, I appreciate your highlighting the, um, the amount by which our uh, unencumbered fund balance exceeds our financial policy threshold. And I also appreciate you drawing attention to the fact that we can really only spend that once, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think we need, to be, we need to be collaborative and thoughtful about how we deploy it so that we can get the best bang for the buck um, with that. And, you know, I think throughout your presentation, you know, you use the term we, because when you live in an open town meeting town, it is we, it is us. You know, so, you know, I think we're very fortunate to have committed volunteers on elected and appointed boards that will s shepherd these kinds of th questions and projects through our town processes um, and eventually present us with a responsible ask and a responsible choice. But you know, all along the way, it's the citizenry, it's all of us, uh, our friends and neighbors, um, coming together around what the priorities are and should be for this town, and and what those priorities are and should be for this town within, uh, you know, within the financial forecast and financial picture that that um, that Mary's outlined so well. So, you know, all of the projects that that Mary talked about, it, like on page five. You know, we all voted for those. I, I see folks in the audience tonight, many of us worked on a number of those projects together. Um, so we are making choices for our community all together. And I think Mary's presentation tonight helps give all of us the tools that we need to, I think, analyze what, what the questions are and then the impact of those questions should we de decide to proceed. Um, Questions. Um, oh, I guess I just wanted to say that um, you know you're absolutely right. So on the last page, um, you know I guess I'd call it uh, capital creep, maybe. Um, uh, <laughs> well, maybe that's not the best way. To say it. <laughs> uh, you know I I was concerned and have expressed this concern a, a number of times um, about capital projects that have been self-selected out of the uh, capital outlay process. And to Mary's point, I think if you've ever looked at the town's capital plan, which is included in your warrant book on an annual basis, um, you'll see that that every department is planning out. And you know again to Mary's earlier point about we don't invest in infrastructure. Well, the numbers show that we invest in infrastructure, and every department in this town has a capital plan. You know, we're not we're not ignoring the fact that we we have we need assets to do our jobs, right? And so, um, you know, I I was concerned that um, that that folks could pick cherry pick things out of that list, and and essentially forge a different path that didn't have the same I think um, vetting process and the same financial guardrails. So I think Tom and Michelle were doing some looking at how other communities um, ad address this similar situation, which is, you know, we have tried on, a, on an annual basis to commit a certain level of our operating dollars um, to fund, you know, operating capital, for lack of a better term, right? And that's capital that we're going to afford within our levy. Um, and, and so the, you know, the question becomes, outside that, Particular capital allocation. Are there other things that we should that we should pay for that we need to pay for, and and how should those projects travel through projects travel through the process? And so I think Tom and Michelle were going to 
pull together some analysis from other communities that might help inform, to your point, you know, what should the parameters look like for projects that might be too big, you know, and might, um, you know, might take up too much room within the operating capital bucket, but still should go through, you know, some sort of processes, uh, I think, to, to uh, be proposed as a warrant article to town meeting. So. I, yeah, I mean, it's so important that that happened, and you hit the nail on the head, Karen. It's it's identifying the 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 policy that can both give the proper direction, but also allow the flexibility needed on any given budgeting uh, cycle. So it's it's that's exactly the research that we're doing. Yeah. And I'd be I'm I'm really interested, Mary, uh, after your discussions with Adcom to you know yeah. to get some feedback on on that point. Um, I know um, uh, Victor over the weekend was at the um, uh, finance committees have an annual meeting and he attended it last week and he said tell me that he was in a workshop and and one of uh, you know a neighboring community Arlington also I think they're a triple triple but you know really strong financial one of the things that they do is they set a, a capital threshold but it's everything so they say we're gonna spend five percent of our budget on capital and that includes the cash capital includes the debt service and you know maybe five percent isn't the right number maybe yeah. that's not the right metric but they're looking at all because right now I get the idea that sometimes it's attractive to make it a Warren article because you can say oh it's going to be funded within the budget so we kind of have this illusion that we're not paying for it well we are paying for it and it it just doesn't feel as rigorous and uh, to me, we should prioritize things based on need. And if a warrant article is submitted for something, it doesn't go through that prioritization process. And a right. no, it doesn't feel right. No, right. And I, I, I can't get my arms around exactly how it should work. Right. But I think that it. I, I think there's danger, um, or there's concern. I think that if we build this, if we build this sort of third lane for capital expenditure without any right. uh, parameters, you know, I, I, I think, you, you know, I think we, we're quickly over, overstating um, capital spending, to your point, to our target. And so. Yeah. And it's going to put pressure on the operating budget because right. we're going right. to have to pay for that <coughs> debt for 20 years. So mm -hmm. that's, right. that's eating up some capacity. Right. I do think there is this sort of notion that when it does that, it's sort of free because right. you don't see it, you don't see the um, <coughs> kind of financial ramification. And you know, as I, I love as a town that we've you know we've we've done some things that I to me are really important to preserve because I think they really help our community. You know, in some communities, when you know when there's revenue that comes in, when there's state aid, like some communities, the school department gets it. So if your school, if your state aid gets cut. The school budget's got to figure out how to pay for it. Um, you know, some communities, they take all the benefits and the debt and they allocate it out and say, you know, this activity, this is, this is like your whole budget. And in Hingham, we rise and fall together with the revenue that we get. And on some of our shared costs, like the debt service and the health insurance and some of these things, we rise and fall together. I, I think that has enhance the cooperative nature of our budgeting and our decision process and um, so I hope we keep that yep because I think yep. it's it helps us I would agree uh, any questions from the audience on Mary's presentation okay well thank you and um, good luck on that I'd, I'd also say if either of you have any additional thoughts to incorporate for adcom I'm happy to um, you know maybe get those to Tom or Michelle yep. and right. um, I'd, I'd like to reflect uh, everybody's thoughts in this. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, I think we have the Bathing Beach Bathhouse update. Alan Peral. You were supposed to show up in bathing suits, I think. <laughs> 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 Since both uh, Ed and I meet the demographic that Mary was alluding to. <laughs> <laughs> I had one run a couple hours at the office. Okay, okay. Yeah, all right. Good for you. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I believe that uh, Sharon probably put uh, some photos in yep. your packets. Um, I took those today so they'd be the freshest photos of, of the status of the building. 
Um, many of you know the history of this. It's been a long time coming. Um, it originally was in, uh, visualized a uh, town meeting almost three or four years ago, uh, probably 40 plus years. It was originally in the master plan of 2007 to have this, and we went through a number of iterations of putting it out for private development. Long story short, um, we ended up funding doing the engineering and arch architectural study of the first 150000 from town meeting. Engineering department was successful in getting us a $700,000 grant from the Seaport Council. So at the end of the day, the building itself is probably worth about a million one. So a large portion of that is being paid for by the state. Um, a lot of infrastructure costs because essentially we had to bring water and sewer all the way almost from Iron Horse over to here. So some of the costs on, on this are where you look at the overall budget, which is a little over a million six. Um, we have some unique situations of the amount of infrastructure we had to pull from quite a distance. We're in a flood zone. Uh, the building had to be built at an elevation, as we've been doing with everything with the trustees, Ed, Chris, and myself. All of our improvements have been accounting for sea level rise. The first one, as many of you know, is the Bathing Beach restoration, which many people just thought was it's beach grass and whatever. The significant part is the buried concrete wall that's underneath that that protects our parking lot and, in many ways, even this building. Um, I also give kudos to um, Susan Murphy, who's been helping us recently through this process. And town officials, Mike Clancy, has been very helpful in working with our builder um, to make sure everything's being done uh, according to Hoyle. Um, so long story short, we had some delays, um, some of it based on soil con uh, considerations. Um, but once we got underway, we originally built this, uh, designed this as a stick built Chapter 149 project. Uh, and the filed sub bids alone were about 450000 um, and the bid was about a million one fifty. We ended up getting a bid by going modular of closer to a million, and by doing modular, the modular component alone, it was about 382,000, was less than the file sub bids alone. So it was a savvy move by engineering uh, and, our, and the committee to say, let's go that route. Um, it added a little time to the project, but at the same time, as many of you knew, we've had a concessionaire, um, Fire King, uh, Greg Acera, who runs Tosca, and they stuck with us for the last, you know, two plus years while we've been going through this. I think it's going to be a good marriage between us because he's made a, quite a commitment to this building. Um, and so the in, in reality, his little uh, Fire King bakery that started in what is now Tosca Cafe okay. is now about a 250,000 square foot warehouse distribution facility in Braintree, wow. which he finished this year. Long story short, as he told Tom and myself, if we had this building ready in the spring, he wouldn't have been ready. He could not do a 250,000 square foot building and have all of that operation being done and pay the attention to his 2,000 square foot kitchen here. Um, so in some ways, we look at this as a little bit of a blessing in the sense that we're going to get everything tight to the weather and be ready to go in the spring of next year. He'll be ready. He can get all his kitchen work done. He can hire his personnel. We can work on how we're going to manage the community room, which is going to be dovetailing with you people because, you know, we're looking for one-day <coughs> liquor licenses. Um, so there's, I think in many ways, the long story short is we're getting a really solid building. The materials are superior. Uh, Sevi Strakowski has done an excellent job in the design of this. It's really supposed to look like a, a boathouse, as he reminds me. Um, the white trim, by the way, will not be white. It's going to be painted that same taupey gray, which they kind of call uh, Hingham gray. So it, it'll be muted. And even the railing system alone in this building is worth about $25,000 because we're in a historic district. And we're using a PVC material, but it's a milled PVC. The cap is mahogany. Uh, the windows are like Marvin integrity windows with mullions inside and outside. The, the doors are Anderson doors that are for this type of climate. Uh, the building was built on helical piles about 75 helical piles. The, the, the uh, piles in the steel frame, which you see in the lower left-hand corner, uh, are themselves worth about $125,000. Uh, now, it's gonna, that's why the building would be solid for a long period of time, but it, it's not something that somebody renting the community room is really going to see, you know. Um, but I think the long story with, with red cedar shingles, the design we have, um, the roofs have a 30-year lifespan, 
Also, by the way, thank you for doing the roof on the uh, gazebo, which conveniently is matching the roof shingles that we have. Um, so I, I think I've just tried to give you some visuals of the building. The main one is the, the windows to the right there, as you're looking at the top picture, are really the takeout windows for the vendor. Uh, it even get, we get into the weeds, even the door that's on the right-hand side is a Dutch door. So if he's extremely busy, that can be a takeout window. So we really had a pretty good relationship with him as we were designing this building. Um, the, we also have benefited, if you look at the lower right-hand corner of page one, we have a new storm swale that is far superior to the, the swale we had before in draining that parking. <coughs> that used to be a problem for years with the farmer's market if we had a heavy rain that it wouldn't drain properly because you had a, a swale that was largely silted over. This is a significant swale. Still goes in the same outfall, um, but it is, I, I've heard very little from Mark Cullings this uh, summer, which tells me the swale's working pretty well, because <laughs> I would hear about it. Um, so, and then if you look at the walkway in the upper left-hand corner, that's an extension of the walkway many of you have seen that was done in conjunction with the Harbor Development Committee this past year. It is going to be extended along the area you see that's already stoned. And as part of our requirement is we take it all the way up to 3A. Um, so that's really going to help a lot as far as access. You know we've got the area through the Grove, now along the beach, going out towards the um, boat ramp parking lot and extending out to 3A. Already you see a lot of people walking this. You go down there any given day and it's, it's much more of a destination just for walking because we have a, a solid path. Um, the decking in the upper right-hand corner, it's EPE, which is probably the most expensive decking, but it wears like iron and really doesn't need to be stained to maintain. It'll weather to a gray, and that almost, you know, certainly for Ed in my lifetime, we won't be treating that uh, deck. Um, the community room is about a 550 square foot room, pretty close to the size of this room, maybe just a tad bit smaller. Uh, I like Seve and Mark's design. We have a vaulted ceiling. Right now, it's all rough. Most of that will be blue board and plaster, except the top area, which will be acoustic tile to control that. The flooring in here is going to be heavy-duty commercial um, vinyl plank, um, kind of a beechwood gray type of thing. Uh, you probably don't see it as well in the picture. It is beadboard along the side. The picture in the middle on the right, where you see the uh, Triumph Contractors workbench, there's actually a mural that I think was in, um, was it the Wooden House or Pages or something, I think? Yeah, pages. In Pages. That has been preserved by the uh, Historic Society, um, and they're willing to donate that to us. So that wall will probably have that mural of the harbor, whenever it was supposed to be representative of, I forget, Bill. 19th century. 19th century. Um, and the lower left-hand corner is only sh showing you about two-thirds of the uh, vendor's area, which he builds 90% of that out. In order for us to make this work, it's almost like doing a, a strip mall where you get a shell, and he has to build it all out. He bemoans us about that, but it's how we <laughs> had to make the thing work. And the area behind that wall is a big walk-in cooler, so, uh, he, and he's got storage on the second floor. And the restrooms alone are each about 500, uh, about 350 square feet in order for them to be handicap accessible. So a lot of the dimensions of this building were dictated by what we had to do by code. Um, but again, long story short, we're going to end up with a very solid, durable building. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's been a cooperation of a lot of people. And I'll commend Ed, who's actually basically took over all the work on the lifeguards this summer while I was working on the building. And we kind of divvy, divvy our things up among the trustees, so each of us has different responsibilities. Um, and working with Tom's office and Susan and Randy Sylvester has been invaluable picking up the slack. Uh, we work very well together. We meet once a week with the, um, with the builders on, on Wednesdays. And Susan and Liz Welch and I go over the budget on every, every other week. So we're pretty comfortable where we are right now price-wise. The advantage of a modular building is there's not too many surprises. The railing system was an extra because they didn't carry what historical wanted. In order to make the budget, we were okay with that. But that was a delta of about 11000 But we had a $22,000 contingency. Um, I don't envision anything of any consequence coming on this uh, that we haven't already done. The gas line's already been brought in from Ship Street. The wiring's already been brought in. Um, it was a big infrastructure project in, in its own. So um, that's kind of it. I don't know if there's any questions the board has. Sure. Uh, Joe, any questions? 
So when can I get my first hamburger here? <laughs> Hopefully in May of next year. Yeah. yeah. Um, Probably an expensive juice drink, too. I think he's going sure. to <laughs> be a fairly high-end snack stand, I think. Um, what impact uh, does this have on parking at the, at the beach? Good question. As part of this project, we added 35 parking spaces. As you pull into the parking lot, on the right-hand side, the area that's gravel now is going to be shelled. We're going to put sh a shell in there. And the area that, that will be paved is the area closest to the turnaround. We cross over the swale. Um, so we actually increase uh, the overall parking. As you probably remember, you're on the zoning board. I think we met jointly this, with the planning this board. This was a leading question. I knew, <laughs> I knew the answer. Exactly. <laughs> um, we had a fairly involved matrix of the assumption that you had multiple things going on at one time, that you had a perfect summer Saturday with people wanting to be at the beach and the high tide was, let's say, at 11 a.m. or noon. Um, the farmer's market was still going on and the snack stand right. was opening up. Um, and in fact, we're even limited as to when we can rent the community room based on whether the farmer's market is, is, is closed. Um, so th there's, there's going to have to be a lot of give and take on that, but we understand what that is. But, you know, really all things considered, if you look at most snack stands, as it is, I think we have 180 parking spaces and we've added about another 30. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't have this many parking spaces. I'm sure like downtown Hingham, some of the you know, uh, sub shops and the restaurants wish they had this much parking in front of them. So I think for a large portion of the time, uh, we'll be fine. It actually leads me to another point. I think the other thing we have to think of this building, what it allows us to do, and the trustees have been working with the Harbor Development on this, is we can have more activities down at the Harbor now. Because to me, this is largely a bathroom project. I, I've been lobbying for years to have bathrooms that are open other than three hours on either side of high tide, nine, nine weeks of the year. Um, so you look at it, it's, we have a community room, it'll be great for small functions, we'll have a snack stand, which I think gives some vitality to that area, but, and the vendor is responsible for maintaining the restroom facilities. So the fact that you'll end up having those type of restroom facilities and an infrastructure, we can support other things, whether it's craft fairs or... Yep. Communities like Burlington, Vermont have a maritime week. They have concerts at their gazebos. We have something that can support that. And then the synergy with the vendor is he'll want us to have things going on. So if we can fill those 150 parking spaces on a non-beach day, those are customers for somebody who we get a percentage of his rent So um, when he hits a certain threshold. So that, to me, is a real win-win, almost on Mary's public-private partnerships. This should be a strong one, I think. You know? Um, and, and the trees that were taken down are going to be replacing. And then, and we actually have to plant more. more. Right, because there's going to be screening uh, off of, for 3A. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah, there'll be screening of, there still will be roll-on dumpsters, more like the ones the Square Cafe uses. Yeah. Not a full-size dumpster, but the ones you have to use down in the square that, you know, have to be, you know, emptied more frequently. But those will be screened off. And even the, um, this chimney is actually going to hide, you know, the vent. For the, so even that aesthetically is better looking than yeah. your typical building that's got some, you know, domed aluminum, uh, you know, vent stack going yeah. through it. Yeah. You know. I have another leading question, which is um, how have the safety issues been addressed? Because now we have a building, we're going to have kids on the beach who want to walk and get refreshments. And they're going to be walking through a parking lot unless we've got some controls in place. Well, hopefully they will do the, use the walkway that we've run to the beach. That right. was part of the That's requirement right. so as well. So there is a specific walkway intended for that purpose. Intended just yes. for that purpose. You know, so it'll be a dedicated walkway that goes right to the left-hand side of the building and also is handicap accessible. That's the part of the, uh, yep. the deck system, which is pretty significant around this building, uh, that'll get a, a wheelchair and everything coming that way. Can, we'll access that side of the building so we can make grade. Um, so I think we've looked at most of the things that happen. I mean, that doesn't mean some kid isn't going to run across the parking lot, but we certainly are going to define that. And now as you start to look at the walkway extending on the beach in front of the uh, gazebo, I think people start using, and we may even start looking at moving our swimming lines, you know, because part of the thing that came out of this, as Tom knows, is it turns out jurisdictionally, we actually, the gazebo may be on, is probably on trustees land. Because if you extended Ship Street, that was the border of where the, the deed was when they deeded the property. So you waited up for us to do the shingles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we'll send you Thank a you. bill. <laughs> but I think we're going to need that synergy in Amber, like in Situate, 
they, they run on, at Third Cliff, they have a maritime center. And they rent a community room, and they have a real procedure on how you get the one-day liquor right. list. So I think you, we're going to be working a lot together in the yeah. coming years on how this whole thing works. You know. Well, I mean, thank you for this. This is we're all looking forward to it. So this is great. Yeah. Mary, um, I think my questions were uh, were all answered. Um, I'd remind people as well that it was about seven hundred thousand dollars came from the Seaport Bond Correct. Council. So. You know, there, this is this is a, a project where a lot of different stakeholders in it, and um, uh, I'm just so appreciative of uh, all of the many people. And um, you know, Tom and Michelle, I know over the summer that this has occupied a lot of your time as well, and I hope that everybody who is involved in this, as they drive by, takes satisfaction in saying, "Hey, I I I helped I helped build that." Um, so uh, I, you know, and and grateful, grateful for Eat Well for uh, you know being being part of this. Um, you know, it might be like you know next summer if if you're starting in May, it might be nice to come in next summer at some point with just like a little bit of an update. You know, sure. how's it going? What have we learned? How's the rental for the community room? What are we using it for? Um, sure. Right. And, um, you know, to, to the extent the One Day Liquor License Program, Sharon Perfetti in our office really does a great job in helping mm -hmm. you sort of s s pull, pull together the kinds of uh, materials that you need to make that run smoothly. Sure. Alan, if, if, if somebody's renting the community room, is the Snack Shack part going to be open? Like, how will that? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, you know, we, he does not have exclusivity okay. on, the, on f serving food there. He probably has a home field advantage that right. he has a kitchen there and no one else does. Um, but uh, so somebody can rent it. Um, and in more cases than not, you, if they're outside caterers, they're probably bringing the food in, almost like the same thing you would do if you were renting the uh, old derby or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, how that gets handled. I think it would be similar to that. Um, but, you know. So a private event would not preclude the sort of regular activity of the snack shack. Not in any way. That I think that's going to be yep. really important going yep. forward. Yes. I think, you know, one we've pitched this as you know community access for everybody. So, I think the community room is a wonderful addition to it, um, but I wouldn't want it to affect kind of the core, the core activity. Yeah, and the design of the building that Sevy came up with is such that as you look building is pretty well set off in its own yeah. way from yeah. the takeout area. Yeah. So if somebody's having, a, you know, a wedding pictures taken, you know, somebody getting an ice cream cone isn't necessarily right beside them, you know. So yeah. I think that that should work out well, you know. Well, Ed and uh, Alan, really appreciate the work of the trustees. As Mary said, a lot of a lot of people had a lot of hand in getting to, to, uh, to this point. And, um, you know, I think that I, I know that it was challenging to meet the budgetary requirements here, and we appreciate your hard work um, to that end. But I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, we're going to hear from Bill Reardon next. I, I just think it brings this whole new opportunity for vitality down to the harbor, and um, really, really appreciate your work on this. Yeah, we're not hearing you can't get there anymore. Right. Like we used to hear about the Whitney Wharf Bridge, the bridge to nowhere. I, don't, I think we hear less of that, you know? and. Yep. And also, not when is it going to go up? I'm hearing, gee, it actually looks pretty good. You know, yeah. so the comments from people rolling down their window are a little more positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you for sticking with it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. thanks for coming in tonight. All right. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Harbor Wharf Walls Resiliency Project. Wow, that's a. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I'm Bill Reardon, Chairman of the Harbor Development Committee. Alan had the lovely flashy pictures. I did want uh, the Sluckman to see what the Boston Globe printed. This is Long Wharf today at 1235 with the, with the water lapping and people walking through six to eight inches of water. Today was the highest tide for the fall. It was one of those king tides. <clears throat> and uh, the harbor Resiliency, the Wharf Resiliency Project is focused right there. Um, the only other uh, flashy thing that I can add uh, happily is that, uh, and, it, and it speaks to much of what Mary <coughs> discussed earlier, as you all know, we are uh, one-third to one-half dredged. 
uh, and, and very happily through extensive work by Michelle, Tom, and particularly Ken Corson, who I absolutely want to, my hat is off to him, to uh, have a, uh, a, a low bid, uh, well below what we had projected, and a uh, grant by the state of up to one half of the cost of dredging, uh, up to a total of $2 million, means that, uh, as Tom and I have discussed, in comparison to what we looked at at town meeting a year ago, where we said, well, it may be four and a half million, and we may get something from the state, or we may not, and, and we'll bond the rest. Uh, instead, we are looking at a situation where it's going to be 2.8 to 3, maybe 3.2, given more material. But um, half of that is going to be funded by the state. And we have in the, in the kitty, if you will, reserved for this purpose uh, that amount. So I don't think there will be, have to be any borrowing. So an example, again, of uh, trying to be opportunistic, use the chances you get, and we just, you know, great thanks to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yep, absolutely. So my purpose tonight <coughs> is to give you a status report, because um, that's, what it, that's what it is. Um, and I want to frame the issue a little bit. Tom, I got a, a big version of this, if that's any better. Sure. Your, your call. <coughs> Just to orient uh, those at home, I think we're going to be able to get up on the screen. I'm going to be talking about the, the resiliency and reconstruction of three town-owned harbor wharves. Um, the first is Town Pier, sometimes known as Iron Horse Park, although it's not iron. Uh, but, and I'm told that it's actually uh, t technically the Victory Park or something to, something to that effect. Uh, the second parcel is uh, the combination of what is currently known as the Veterans Memorial, uh, the, the um, Vietnam Vet Veterans Memorial, as well as the mobile station parcel that featured in Mary's slides earlier where we purchased, uh, purchased that. Is that picture up? Or? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. You, 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 can, you can point that things out. Thanks. To, and, and the third is, uh, very importantly, Barnes Wharf, <coughs> which, of course, is subject to uh, an arrangement that the town has with Hingham Maritime, uh, where they are running their maritime center and they have uh, building plans to expand fairly dramatically uh, the, the infrastructure and the assets that they are having on, on the wharf. So um, to go back, I think the last time that I met with you was a joint meeting that Alan and I had sometime in the spring. I think it was in the hiatus just before town meeting where we were talking about um, just generally conditions on the harbor. Um, we, that was obviously before the whole water company issue. It was before, I believe, the Hingham Maritime received their grant for the float system. So that wasn't in the picture. Um, and as you know, we've, we've had some personnel issues that have impacted how uh, the, the folks that we could work with on, on, on this project. At the time that we, um, met with you, I think we were thinking in terms of it might be efficient to try to move all three of these projects along uh, a matrix of permits uh, to, be, to be granted. Uh, Tom, and maybe we could put up the, the permit schedule now. Um, that we would try to do those kind of simultaneously. Well, as, as part of um, my understanding from Tom last week that you really wanted to try to get an update on this now, and I, we had not had substantive meetings recently, uh, in, in part because of our, our, our issues uh, in town, uh, I did uh, reach out to Beals and Thomas, our consultant, longtime consultant on this project, and between the last couple of days um, had an opportunity to update with them where, where did the where do the designs stand for each of the three different wharves? Where is, what's, the, what's the permit situation? What's the timing? And then very importantly, to pick up again on Mary's point, uh, what are the alternatives for, uh, for financing? Where might we look uh, outside of our own uh, uh, appropriation at, 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 at town meeting? So all of that um, got reviewed today with uh, our liaison, Joe, um, and Tom Mayo. Later this afternoon, I had a more extensive uh, discussion with Beals and Thomas. Um, and a couple of things you know, be, became clear. Uh, first is that there, there is a distinction now between kind of where we stand with the different projects. Town Pier is the furthest along. 
it's it's um, one of the more complicated projects because uh, it's going to involve uh, taking what is now parking on the right hand side as you go out to the to the wharf and making that part of the park yep. because we're raising the as you, you'll remember we're raising the level of the wharves by about three and a half feet all three of the wharves that we're talking about that creates a situation where you could have water coming over and and gathering and pooling and it doesn't have anywhere to go so from a design perspective, the folks at Beals and Thomas had to deal with storm, storm water treatment. Mm -hmm. And like Alan's swale, you can't simply just put it back into the ocean. You've got to do you know, some, some treatment of that. Um, so all of those things have worked in. But Beals and Thomas has gone very far with that. And that, is, that project is the furthest along from a, from a design standpoint, almost ready to come to the first group of permit um, grantors, which are which are member uh, organizations within the town, whether it's the Conservation Commission or the Planning Board or the ZBA. Um, the other part that enters into what what becomes um, their recommendation, Bills and Thomas recommendation to us, and I, I I need to caveat everything I'm saying by t this evening by saying that I'm sharing material that I've I've only gathered since the last time that my committee met. Uh, Bruce McElhoney, who's co-chair of the committee, is here tonight. He's hearing some of this for the first time. We have not had a chance to meet, uh, you know, vet it, test it, and, you know, come forward with a recommendation. But I'm just sharing in the interest of status. Where, where are we? So I, I learned a good deal about <clears throat> this um, uh, municipal uh, vulnerability program and the financing that is available from that. Uh, there were some schedules that were developed by the engineering group last spring in April um, that targeted uh, going to the state uh, over a couple of years, not kind of all, all at once, in part because the permitting might come through not all at once because, as I said, uh, Town Pier is further along. Barnes Wharf, with some of its complexities, the back and forth with the Hingham Maritime, makes that one more difficult. Uh, Vietnam Vet Veterans Park and Mobile is fairly straightforward, so that one's pretty far along as well. But it turns out that um, this program to, to request grants of the state, and this has been very visible by the governor, he said, look, I'm going to have more money for this. But the program is fairly new. It's only been within the last two to three years. They don't have a set schedule for filing to, to make a grant request, nor do they have a set schedule for when they are going to tell you how much money you get. But they do have one requirement, and that is that the year that you get it, you must spend it by the end of that fiscal year. So this is very tough for towns. So for example, the next available slot to uh, request would be sometime in mid-November, two to three weeks from now, uh, for a grant that would be made perhaps in the December, early January time frame, but it would have to be spent by June 30th. Realistically, we're just not there for, uh, for this to, 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 buy, to participate in that cycle. So I had the conversation with Eric Loss, uh, and you'll remember that Beals and Thomas are the firm that did help us to get our uh, certification as a municipal uh, b vulnerability uh, certified town, and we, we have that in hand. Uh, so they are very familiar with this process. So I asked Eric, I said, well, given the fact that <clears throat> there is no set time frame, what do you expect is reasonable here, given that the governor has made a point of saying, hey, resiliency is an issue. I've got to, we've got to push more money there. And his, his expectation is that probably sometime in the spring, perhaps late spring, perhaps a round town meeting, there will be another opportunity to request grants probably in the early summer, early to mid-summer. And that would allow a municipality to uh, gear up, plan, and actually do a project and get it completed before June 30 of 2021. So th there's that aspect of kind of tying the, f the funding I into uh, the, the permit process. And the other part that um, <clears throat> Eric wanted to share with me is he said, 
You know, these are complicated uh, programs, and, and the uh, draft permit matrix that um, mm -hmm. Tom has put up shows the number of different permits that are required from so many different agencies. Whenever you get near the water, you, you end up touching a lot of uh, requirements and, and agencies. So Eric's view is, look, they believe they've been very thorough in their design, for example, of Town Pier, but <clears throat> they would almost like to go forward with a straw man uh, to see if there are things that arise that might impact the later two filings mm -hmm. for, for veterans and, and for Barnes. So again, that seems to point to uh, a feeling that, look, what can we realistically do? I, I've always argued for we need to be opportunistic and we need to press these things forward, especially given pictures like this and what we saw in March of 2018. Um, but I don't want to try to do so much, especially when we're lacking somewhat in internal engineering resources to, to make all of, all of this happen. So Eric's recommendation to us, which we'll consider in our committee and, and come back to you when we have you know, more, more uh, meat on the bone, if you will, is to think about going forward in this uh, annual meeting cycle with a warrant article that would uh, do perhaps somewhat what we did with, with um, dredging last year, to say, let's proceed uh, with the uh, effort to have Town Pier be the first one that we do, uh, put out the dollar amount in total, uh, it mention that we intend to go to the state, just as we did with, with dredging, and if the state grants us, it could be up to $2 million. Uh, then obviously the, the, the demand would decrease. Uh, the other aspect, and I have not explored this as much, and it, it, it's impacted in part by the success of Allen's project. You may remember that we've been sort of holding back from looking to one other source, which is the Seaport Bond Council, right. mm -hmm. because we had kind of two projects that weren't really showing the kind of progress that they like to see. So how the Seaport Bond Council might enter into a further you know, discount, if you will, off the cost to the town is something that we all, we all want to spend time and, and understand and, and, and push forward. So I, um, I think I'm going to stop there just saying that I, so what I, what I, what I believe we're, we're picturing to consider for, the, for this annual town meeting year would be to go forward with a request of the town to appropriate and f go forward with construction, the permitting page that you have, the, the one page that I showed you, shows that that's pretty doable. And I pushed Eric pretty hard today. I said, I, I want this to be a reasonable uh, calendar. I don't want it to be a, a wannabe, you know, a, a wish, w wish we'll make it. And he said, look, we're going to have to work hard, especially with all of the other, you know, boards in the town. And Tom assured me that he would help, you know, internally. Mm -hmm. um, he said, with that, I, I think this is, this is doable. Um, so that would be our thought, and that we would um, propose that uh, in, a, in an article. Um, again, as I said, done in, in sort of two, two fashions, a, gro a gross number, something in the order of four and a half million dollars is what I'm recalling on a, we, we had costs that were uh, set in 2018, and we'd now be going forward into 2020, so you've got to you know, escalate them for inflation. Um, and, and then, uh, at the same time, be, be prepared to file with um, the um, Municipal Vulnerability Program for a grant. Great. Thank you. Joe. I asked him all my questions this morning, so I'm, I'm good. How about any questions you already know the answers to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mary? You, you don't have any leading questions? I, I, <laughs> Bill, um, just on this chart, it looks like uh, the DEP, there's a Chapter 91 minor modification. Yes. Is that... It, it, it's, it's actually a very interesting point, Is Mary. that already in process, or? L let, me, let me explain. I, I noted that myself, circled it, and it is one of the reasons why the timing, if you were to, if you were to look at the other schedules, which were much rougher, because it's yep. just, we're, we're not as far along. I asked him, I said, well, why is it that you think we can proceed with this as a minor modification, whereas the other two would be a new, a new certificate? The answer is part, uh, partly um, 
sort of legislative in the sense of what else has happened to Town Pier during the period of a Chapter 91 license. Chapter 91 licenses go for a very long time. Alan, is it 20 years? No, um, so to the extent that we have been in front of the agencies that grant Chapter 91 licenses, and we've done stuff with Town Pier or extending the, the, the wharves that we put in on, a, on an annual basis, uh, generally that's done with um, special permits. But Beals and Thomas had gone back, done the homework, realized that they had a chance to request an, a not new, but, but a modification of, of an existing Chapter 91. And they have a close enough relationship with the Southeast Regional Director that he said, you know, I think this is a, reason, this is a reasonable request. So that's, so that's, the, that's why the, the difference between that and the other two. Okay. And if, if, can we apply for both grant programs or does it, does the state sort of say, hey, choose one, either Seaport Bond or? That's one of the questions that I don't know the answer to. Okay. Yeah. And it's one that we yeah. clearly want to pursue. And, it, 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 and in part, it's a strategy question for the sure. town. Are we, are we far enough along with the Seaport Bond Council that this is, this is a, re sure. a reasonable request? Or should we stay within? I mean, this, uh, the governor has really made a point of this resiliency issue. And, and they, they know it. Um, and, and he's talking about pushing you know, more money in that direction. State does have a $680 million uh, surplus this fiscal year, just, just completed, and he's talking about aiming some, some of those funds, so. Um, I, I would just say I appreciate that this has been a really kind of methodical process, and so from time to time you've come in to say, hey, you know, here's our analysis about how high we need to sort of build everything mm -hmm. to. What do we think? Here's, it's, it's very helpful, particularly on a big project like this, to get those periodic updates. And I think when it comes time to um, request something from town meeting, showing that we've had this diligent public process um, is, is going to be really helpful. I know there's been some talk over time about, you know, do you do them all at once? And there may be some cost synergies and things like that. Um, by the same token, and I, I appreciate your um, being here for the, the financial piece, in some ways kind of pacing things out, it, it, it fits better financially, but I'd also say kind of for town meeting, you know, hey, this is, this is, this is phase one, mm -hmm. and this is what's going to happen. I, I think the last thing I would say is just, you know, we, we have a lot of different capital needs, and it, to me, the resiliency here is so important because you have Route 3A, you have sewer pumping stations. I mean, the, the potential consequences of flooding in that area are, are really significant. And so as it, as it comes time to make the case to town meeting, um, I think that's going to be really important to do um, because this, is, this to me is not a nice to do, this is a must do. Um, not not that, to be, to be clear, not that doing these three wharves alone solves all of our problems of because there are other yes. vulnerabilities. But it is interesting, I think you're all aware, that Wait. the multi municipal vulnerability process that we went through identified mm -hmm. flooding as the highest you know, level risk that the town faces. So I think we're trying to put our resources where, where they're needed long term, and, and as we know, it's both sea level rise, which is tides, and then you also have storm surge, and that's a different question. Well, and, and something you said earlier, sort of for me, again, kind of this staged approach is um, sometimes when you do the first one, you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that it's kind of resonating with me as, as far as um, how to, you know, how to best, best approach this. Especially where the state is still feeling their way on this this new grant program. Right. You know, they, they, they're, they're not, they, I, Eric told me today that they just hired four more EEA, and I don't even know what EEA stands for, but personnel to, man, to help manage this grant request process. So they're, they're learning. Uh, they, they may do two or three RFRs a year, uh, and, and we'll, we'll be in a position to uh, be, be ready for those. The, the point that he did emphasize, you know, Joe asked the question this morning, 
do you have to have all your permits before you make your application? And the answer was, the closer you are, the better. It's called shovel ready, mm -hmm. you know, a concept that we're all very aware of. Yeah, I, I would say, especially if it's a new program and the governor is putting a lot into it, the governor wants to success. be able to have some success yeah. stories to yep. point to. And you know, you, you think about East School, um, back in 2007, we said, hey, let's be like ready to go so that when the right. MSBA starts, we're a good community, we're solid, we've, we've got all our ducks in a row. It's kind of what we're doing here. Thank you. Good. Great. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Thank you. Thanks for being here. No, Jim. Jim Watson, 291 Rockland Street. Bill, that's an amazing presentation. But the thing that puzzles me, we're talking about raising the level of the wharfs a couple feet. But does that leave the areas between them unprotected, or is this a wall? So that was what I was responding to Mary when I said, even if we do, and it's not a couple of feet, it's three and a half feet. Three so and it's, half. It's, a, it's a significant increase from where we are now. And we, and we got to that after a very careful thought about, well, what are we trying to do? How many years are we trying to look out? And you remember the Kleinfelder report talked about looking at 2030 and then 2070, and we chose somewhere you know beyond 2030, but not out 50 years because it's just very hard to tell. Uh, so that's that one aspect. But you're absolutely correct. You know, to the extent, for example, um, when when 3A is reconstructed, uh, we have the rotary, and the rotary is one of one of the low spots, and technically the wall by the rotary is not the state's, it's ours, it's the town's. Uh, so we may have during that reconstruction to look at that one more kind of opportunistic piece. There are things that can be done on a short-term basis. Uh, if you know a, a major storm is coming, uh, towns in, in flood-prone flood areas do have these temporary kind of Jersey barriers that can be put in place. And I could foresee this, this might be 20 years from now, where the, we, would, we would set a line that would say, OK, we're going to start at Iron Horse Pier, and we're going to close off Route 3A to Ship Street with these temporary barriers that would, might be there for a couple of days. It might be just one tide cycle and other similar gaps in the, in the So in that could be done between the wharfs, too, then? Yes. So, so three and a half feet higher yes. from the present Whitney Wharf. Not, not Whitney Wharf. The okay. Whitney Wharf is already at the height that we are, that okay. we are targeting. That's at, uh, it's 16.2 feet above mean low water. Today's tide was 12 feet. It's, so it's when we have four. storm surge that adds another three or four that we get in trouble. Thanks, Jim. And hopefully we'll all be around to see these high tides. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Uh, in the interest of our audience, I'd like to I'd like to move to um, number nine, the town hall study committee discussion. I see Mr. Kerry in the audience, and I looks like we lost Mr. Kervin, but appreciated his attendance. Um, so, you know, for me, I think one of the themes of the evening this evening is kind of getting back to business. Right? We've 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 worked really hard uh, over the last several years on the lead up to the purchase of the water company, and, and Mary continues to pull the laboring oar on behalf of the board in in conjunction with the water transaction. But we have a lot of business to do, and I think tonight is one of those meetings where you see us really digging into the business of the town. Uh, and and uh, sort of on the heels of Mary's discussion with respect to capital needs and capital projects, you might recall that um, this, this board asked a group of citizens to come together and think about the town hall campus and a sort of a bigger vision for the town hall campus. And I think the, the reality of the lineup of capital projects is that, um, you know, we've got schools and fire stations and and wharves and a, a, a lot of expenditures um, uh, kind of in our pipeline. And one question I think I had was um, with respect to this building that serves so many people so well and houses so many of our services and employees, um, might there be ways to work within the current physical plant um, to relieve some of the um, workplace issues that we have and service-related issues that we have? 
you know, or maybe not, but um, it, it, are there sh sort of smaller capital projects, shorter term capital projects that we might take on um, to address some of those needs? So, um, uh, so I've, I, I asked to put it on the agenda because I thought it was worth us um, considering. And, um, you know, I think my, my sense of the good work of the town hall study committee was they, they talked to every single department. They came up with a fairly lengthy questionnaire about usage and um, service levels uh, that I think would bring a great deal of expertise um, to this kind of more directed discussion. And I, I think where I was kind of going with this was um, in order to, to try to maximize efficiency around the knowledge base that this group already has would be to ask them to work with Tom and Michelle um, on, a, on a kind of on a timeline and a project basis directed through the Board of Selectmen's office, you know, that potentially would give us some things to think about in time for potentially this town meeting cycle. Um, so that was the other reason I think for the timing tonight is if we're going to do that, we need to get to work pretty quickly. Yeah. And again, to me, it made sense, again, given that, given that sort of compressed timeline to bring together folks who have already spent a great deal of time thinking about this. So that's where I am on it. I don't know whether you've had a chance to think about it and have any, any thoughts you'd like to share. I've spoken to Tom about it as well, and I think this is absolutely the way to go, and now is the time to do it. Uh, there are needs, and um, you know, I've been down at the um, Senior Center, and that, which is part of this, um, and I'm, I'm really encouraged that you're moving in this direction. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't want the public to think that this is the long-term solve. No. Yeah. I think what we're, right. what we're talking about here are, are some right. short-term things that will help us live within the space we have. But I, I think the tricky part of this is going to be what's that, what's that Goldilocks amount of improvements that, that makes a difference particularly I think in the senior center where, um, and I think we're gonna hear a lot of that tomorrow sure. when we go there, um, but I, I, I don't want people to kind of go, oh, okay, senior center town hall, that's all done. Because if, you know, again, you look at the rising senior population, the, the space that's there is not nearly adequate enough. Um, and I think I'm all for making improvements to it, but let's make sure we brand this the right way yep. because yep. this is this yep. isn't this isn't the solve and we may you know in short order we may find a, a long-term opportunity may present itself as we're continuing to go about the business of the town so right. that, that's just no I, I completely agree and I think that I, I, I think this exercise is not unlike what we've undertaken with respect to other buildings and in particular the schools. Right. So sometimes we know we have a longer term fix that needs to occur, um, but the timeline to get to that fix doesn't, doesn't provide, I think, the, the real need at the moment. So, you know, John Ferris from time to time will, to, will say we need a capital infusion to breathe a little more life yeah. into a particular space. And so Mary's absolutely right. I don't, I, I am certainly not by this um, suggestion th proposing that this is the fix for the town hall campus because the reality is, the reality is that the functions here have outgrown the space. Mm -hmm. Um, and that we're bumping up against really our ability to provide the kind of services we need to provide in this building um, in, the, in the way that we want to provide it. And that's not, you know, this isn't also thinking that we need a Taj Mahal, but we do need, you know, we do need a, a physical plant and a, a, and a parking uh, arrangement that allows people to come here and get the services they need, participate in the programs they want to participate in, and for our employees to have suitable, safe, workspace and you know it may be that the committee comes back and there's not much we can do but I feel like I, I guess I feel like we at least ought to ask the question are there some short-term dollars we could spend to to breathe a little life for a couple more years as we continue to think about other alternatives because even if we had a solution today right it was going to take some time it would, it would take time right M my understanding 
is that the senior center has commissioned an architect that has been or I'm, I'm commissioned is a strong word. Okay, yes. has has gotten some recommendations right. from an architect yeah. and, and someone who who That's deals right. with senior spaces that 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 will be helpful additional input beyond the body of work. So again, I I just would That's exactly right. Let's let's take all of the intelligence that we have. Yep, um, I would agree. Tom, do you want to anything you'd like to offer? No. Okay. <coughs> sorry, sorry, can you, sorry. Tom Carey, 1131 Main Street, and I chair the Town Hall Facilities Study Committee. Uh, and I've got some long-term familiarity with this building. The, um, there is no question, when, when we started this project, it was a 1991 report uh, that we had a whole bunch of separate buildings, single purpose, single use, out of date, no handicapped accessibility, um, and we were looking at huge amounts of money going into each one of them and everyone had warrant articles. I want this for my building, I want that for the other building. At the same time, we were sitting with a 90,000 square foot vacant former Central Junior High that had been shut down uh, upon the failure of an override for the schools. Hello, uh, we'd had proposals to knock this building down and sell off the house lot to help repair these other inadequate buildings. So the planning, really, the thinking, started after that report. And it was um, 93 when the study, when the, the vision of you could have a campus, you could have a civic center, we could consolidate a lot of places and get efficiencies, you, you've got meeting rooms available for more than one organization and so on. And that's a long time ago. Uh, it was completed in 1998. The, so we're 25 years out really from the completion or certainly from the study. Interestingly, this project was the first major project for town infrastructure, capital infrastructure, buildings, not how often you're replacing your automobiles, uh, since 67, when the town hall and the library had been built. Wow. Uh, which, and the town hall by then, except for one selectman no longer with us, uh, was totally inadequate. And you had the police were inadequate. The senior center was in 500 square feet of space in Hersey House. Yeah. Um, and so the town bought the vision that we should renovate this, move all of those separate places in here, get those efficiencies, and dispose of the properties. Um, the accountant's building down next to Old Derby used to be the school building. We sold it off, it's on the tax rolls. Um, the dentist is where the, on 3A is where the police station used yeah. to be. That's productive. And I think it's fair to say not only was this project well received at the time, um, but in retrospect, it has been an enormous success. The senior center, at least in my discussions with various seniors and the people over there, uh, g the general consensus is, boy, if we could stay here, we'd love it. But we don't have enough space. They went from, f from three, 300 square feet to 5,000 square feet. Um, our senior center was the talk of the South Shore. Other communities were coming to look at this place and to look at this beautiful senior center. Um, in the process of our work in the committee, I've personally visited Situate, Marshfield, Hanover, 
Rockland, Wellesley, we are no longer the talk of the South Shore. Uh, Situate had something like uh, nine or 12,000 and was adding another four. Uh, Marshfield was, was up high and was adding another nine. So in terms of what other communities have for the seniors who are in the general uh, population, we've fallen way behind. So the need for the senior center, I think, is clear. Um, in our studies, we have been looking at options to keep it in this building because it's the right spot in terms of access to police, access to the treasurer, access to assistance from town, and the like. Um, the police station had gone from uh, the small building on 3A to uh, 10,000 square feet, and they were swimming in space compared to what they had been in before. That's no longer the case. And as time passes, there are other needs. The same can be said pretty much for most apartments all through the, the building in, in one degree or another. But it is clear to me that there are things, personally speaking, that can be done to dramatically improve the working situation here at Town Hall which has really been intolerable for quite some time. Um, zoning um, restrictions on use of parts of the building, which have been in, in existence from the beginning because of perceived inadequacy of parking. Um, parking is strangling the ability of the school department to bring its people in to meet. It's strangling the senior center, it's strangling everything. So some of these issues can be addressed. Some modifications within the building can be done. There are some other options. I think if we continue to study the original concept of a campus here, in the midst of 20 acres of publicly owned land in the center of the community with the synergies of joint uses that it entails, we will be looking toward a future that will be uh, just as well received as the last quarter century has been. Um, as part of the overall picture that you're describing with this hundred million dollars or so of projects, um, my position would be that uh, some of the needs that are being met inadequately here at Town Hall are just as deserving and need to be done as some of the others. So I know, I looked at the numbers, um, it's a choice the town is going to have to make. But unfortunately, the ones that are being dealt with here haven't had anything done in a structural capacity growth for the last 25 years. So we've got this pattern of you build a couple of new buildings for town operations, and then a quarter of a century goes by before you say, oops, we have to do something else again. Our tax base isn't going to look too good if credit rating agencies start asking themselves, why a community like that is providing fire safety services out of 80-year-old buildings. Why aren't they keeping their infrastructure up? Um, the people who've paid the taxes while their kids were in school and are thinking, well, isn't this a wonderful community to remain in, are going to have second thoughts if the only seniors who are getting the kind of services that they ought to get are those who can afford several hundred thousand dollars as a deposit and go into a private lifestyle. So we all know that the money that's spent, if it's spent well on town services, is critical to the entire community. 
I don't like the idea that we've let another quarter of a century go by without putting aside a depreciation fund for the day when the increase in needs had to be met. It's sort of like our unmet needs for pensions. Um, on the whole, we need to, I think, pay more attention to that rather than just building them when we need them. You know, the school's worn out, so we build a new school. And then one of these days, the fire department is in line, or the police are in line, or the seniors are in line. So I applaud the extent to which you're looking at these long-term financial needs and the numbers, and I recognize that that has to all be taken into account. Uh, and it will be, and the community will be making some choices on these large structural projects. But I think it is worth taking a hard look at how much we can accomplish to improve the lives of everyone in this building, police, senior, everyone, uh, town, staff, meeting rooms, uh, availability, just being able to get in the place to be able to use the services. But clearly, other communities have done it. There are ways to try to address it to ameliorate some of these problems. Um, and I would certainly echo um, the notion that this is not in any way a desire to throw all of these various departments under the bus or put them aside as we're, we're foregoing long-term study. I take your charge to be continue with the long-term study and analysis and options and to add uh, a more targeted uh, shorter-term perception of what can we do in the meantime to make things better around here? And, and I'm happy to work with Tom and Michelle, and uh, I'm sure that we can come up with at least something, too, because there's plenty that needs amelioration. <laughs> yep. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, so if, if, you, if you're amenable, then maybe for next time I, I could work with Tom and Michelle on, on Kind of a mini charge, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I would, I would love on January twentieth, right, to have exactly. a Warren article, and and I think, I think one way or another, I think there's going to be a school on the town meeting warrant for April. I just, I have that feeling, and I, I want to be able to, you know, I, I think whenever we're asking the town for when there's a big ask, I think different parts of the community want to look and go, okay, somewhere in this warrant, there's a little something for me. Um, yep, I'm, yep. I'm really, I really want yep. something, and 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 I I do understand that there are a lot of different needs in this group. I'm particularly interested in the senior center because uh, I think for many of these folks, the ask, the ask on a school project, MSBA or no MSBA, is is going to be a big one, and for some, the third in ten years, and. So I, I, I want this coming town meeting, I don't want it to be divisive. Yep. <clears throat> so I, I think that that short-term piece is going to be super duper important. Right. Okay. So, um, so Tom, just so you're clear, um, I think I'll work with Tom and Michelle to draft some language and I think our intent would be to have it on the agenda to vote um, next Tuesday, right? Um. Okay. All right, thank you. Great to serve at your pleasure anyway, so whatever you want us to do. Thank you, appreciate <laughs> it. Um, okay, and then the next, um, moving back to number eight, which is the naming bylaw discussion. So, you know, this, this uh, the, the, the reason why I think I, I wanted to have it on the agenda for us to talk about tonight is, um, is I think the, the importance, um, and we've seen the importance, of uh, public-private partnerships with respect to municipal projects. And given, uh, again, the capital projects that are on the horizon, uh, there are components of certain of those projects that uh, lend themselves, I think, to, to private support. 
Um, you know, in particular, as, as folks know, um, the Maritime Center has been um, fundraising, you know, over the last several years and will continue to do that uh, to meet their obligations with respect to the wharf area. Um, you know, South Shore Country Club has the Friends of South Shore Country Club. There are folks in this town who, above and beyond their tax contributions, contribute philanthropically to important municipal projects. And so, you know, one of the questions is, uh, do, do our bylaws kind of keep pace with best practices in public-private pi partnerships? Um, and in particular, in recognizing and celebrating those people who step up above and beyond what they're required to do and, you know, and, and contribute um, philanthropically in a way that alleviates the tax burden or augments um, important municipal projects. And uh, so I, I, I think, uh, and I, I did have the opportunity to talk to Ed Siegfried, who was on um, the original naming bylaw committee uh, several years ago, and, um, and did confirm with him that, that at that time that group didn't consider um, codifying rules with respect to public-private partnerships. So the bylaw, you know, speaks to naming public buildings and public lands, but it doesn't contemplate those situations where there could be um, significant private dollars that are utilized in either constructing or, again, augmenting um, public buildings or public lands. Um, and, you know, we have seen in particular uh, the, the generosity of, of, the, of the people of this town um, in the fields project at the high school. Uh, you know, it's a, a beautiful facility. It's a beautiful community facility. Uh, and it wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been possible without significant um, private support. So I guess I just, I, I think this is the wave of our future. Um, I think that, so, so I guess I don't want the town to have any impediments artificial impediments um, to facilitating really f fulsome private philanthropic support for municipal projects. And so my suggestion would be that we get, you know, we get a small group together. Again, I would think a very targeted, um, a targeted ask on this um, to take a look at what peer communities are doing, take a look at the importance of, um, of private support in this town and, you know, potentially suggest amendment language by January 20th to this bylaw. So I don't know whether you have had a chance to think about that and have any comments on that. And I've read, um, I've read the article, Article 40, um, and there are clear limitations here. Um, and uh, we, we've got away the um, the need for funding uh, against um, what those who've come before us have viewed as appropriate for how, how the town should be naming uh, buildings, lands, institutions. Um, so I think having a committee that looked at it and looked at how our peer communities have addressed it is, is the appropriate next step. Okay. Mary? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've heard over the last couple of years, I know I've heard from people who have felt like um, there are aspects there are there are aspects of this that don't contemplate private dollars, and therefore it's I think sometimes people are having a, a difficult time navigating through. Um, I, I would you know I think with something like this because this this arose from a very emotional issue in the town so I want us to handle it in a in a way that is really constructive so you know I, I know it's October 29th but I think we should in some way try to advertise to make people aware that if they want to help out and serve on this and I, I'm not suggesting we spend like eight weeks drumming things up but to, to me it's going to be important that people feel like they had the opportunity to put their name yeah, yeah, forward yeah. for consideration. It doesn't rule out reaching out to people if we think it's okay, but um, I just think that the town meeting is going to look at the process by which any refinements were done yep. 
as much as the refinements themselves. So I think we want to handle it, you know, handle it in that way. Um, and it would it would strike me that um, in particular, there's you know, in terms of the procedure, there's a role here that the historic commission plays. And so it would again, I'm I'm thinking about who would be stakeholders that would be. It, we want citizens on this committee, but I think we want to make sure certain voices are at the table. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, the, those pieces I think are important. Um, you know, we've got, so I don't remember if we're meeting on the 12th. You know, normally when we do a committee like this, we, we, we sort of publicize it for like two weeks and yeah, make we're not, appointments we're not, or we're nine, not meeting on the, the yeah. nine, so you know what we uh, I'm thinking you know uh, Carol is here from the anchor we can get something in the journal we can put out hang them notice I just want to do a blast to make people aware it's on our radar screen so that people have a chance I agree with you I think a small group is better um, given the time frame I guess the question I have is uh, you know I think there were a number of citizens including Mr. Siegfried and others who put a lot of time and thought into this and I think it would be important to me that that a group that is looking at this really kind of start by getting a good download from that committee because um, right. yeah, I think that they did context. they yeah. did important thoughtful sensitive work um, in a period of time and I, I don't want to lose that um, Right, I think that's a great point. So, so what is it? The nineteenth. The nineteenth. Yeah. Yep. So, um, if we if we could do the blast almost starting tomorrow, yep. right? Yep. Exactly. And um, uh, and then plan to have something on the agenda for the nineteenth. Are, are you thinking five people? Three? I mean, we always do right. odd numbers. Yeah. So, it, well, I would say no more than five. Okay. Yeah, I think that, that is, would be my reaction. Yep. Um, Five may be the right number. I mean, I, 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 I hear your point that, you know, I, I don't want to shortchange the process piece of this. Um, you know, I, initially I would have thought three, but I think that, you know, again, depending on what the um, response is, maybe to the um, to the ask for, from people, that would inform maybe the size. But I would, I my view would be no more than five. I think. It's a pretty compressed time period, so you, just pragmatically, right? You need you need yeah. folks to be able to get together. Uh, I would also say that there's probably going to be an aspect of this that involves council, yeah. and so it'll be important for you guys, you know, to to know when to engage council at the right time, so that if a group is heading in a direction that right. legally doesn't work, mm -hmm. we're not, you know, we're not spinning our wheels. Um, I would just also suggest with with these groups, Tom and Michelle. I know you're you've got and, and Karen, you've got periodic updates with Adcom. I think this is a time of year when Adcom would find it helpful to know this because they're going to want to have liaisons and have people start attending the town hall study committee meetings and really kind of getting embedded in this work. So I meet with Adcom weekly. Yeah. The Adcom leadership. I'll I'll bring them up to speed on this. One thing I was wondering is, uh, could we on the fifth maybe come back and discuss a final charge for yeah, that's probably a good for idea. potentially right. appointments on the nineteenth? Right. Okay. And and Carol, I think for you know purposes of the anchor, this is this is looking at the existing bylaw. I mean, I, I think without a charge, we sort of know what we want to do here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I I think we right. can start getting the word out. It's really. Yeah, so I would say, to Mary's point, it's looking at the existing bylaw and reviewing peer communities uh, and making recommendations with respect to a potential amendment of the existing bylaw to, to take account of uh, public-private partnerships. So municipal buildings and lands um, that would be funded or augmented by private dollars. So anyway, I think um, again, it, it, it sort of trying to move us in the right direction and anticipate, I think, um, uh, continued uh, private support for the many municipal projects that we have, um, and, and we're we're grateful for that. Um, any questions from the 
public on the naming? Okay, so charge on the on the fifth, you'll get the uh, word out yes. for talent bank um, applications, and we'll look to hopefully make some appointments on the nineteenth. Okay. So, um, so I'll put this in, but um, where? So would you just go to talent? Talent bank. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, okay. Available online. They're on, available okay. online. Yes. Okay. And they can be submitted to my office. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Sure. Um, do we have any appointments tonight? Sure. 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 So I've got the list here, but I don't see the names. I would um, make a motion to appoint Daniel Miller Dempsey to the Traffic and Safety Committee to fill an unexpired term ending June 30th, 2021. Second. Uh, all's in favor? Aye. 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 And I'd just like to thank Mr. Dempsey. He actually went to the traffic committee meeting to do something. He was there to opine on an issue. Loved what they did. His son was there, said, I want to be part of this. Wow. And it's just great that when people engage in their government and want to step up. So is Glenn's sparkling personality that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I move that we appoint, is it Matt? Matt Matthew Person. Matt, Matthew Person uh, to the Traffic and Safety Committee for a three-year term ending June 30, 2022. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And nothing against Glenn, but I believe Sergeant Kilroy has been attending. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> uh, okay, and I think we've got some one-day liquor licenses. The chief's not here, but I'm assuming, Michelle, everything's uh, in order on these. Yes, he's reviewed them and doesn't have any issues with those or the, um, the sidewalk um, okay. requests as well. I'm just not seeing. Uh, so I have legal seafood. I've got East Elementary. Um, do we have the women's, women's club? Um, I have one if you need it. There's yeah, I see. Just one page. Um, it's only three. Oh, 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 there we go. There we go. All right, it was all, it was all, uh, okay. So and we got the other is Main Street. Yep. yep. Okay. Oh, I see it. Uh, okay. So I would accept a, a motion to approve the application of Legal Seafoods LLC do DBA Legal C 96 Derby Street for a change of officer to the LLC Board of Managers from Edward Penega Penegas to Eric Chris, as outlined in the letter from the Massachusetts Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission dated September 20, uh, 2019. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I would accept the motion to approve the issuance of a special one-day wine and malt beverages license to Suzanne Garland on behalf of the East Elementary School PTO for the East Elementary Parent Social to be held at the Hingham Community Center on Friday, November 15, 2019, from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I would accept a motion to approve the issuance of a special one-day all-alcoholic beverages license to Molly Roberts on behalf of the Hingham Women's Club for Evergreen Evening to be held at the Hingham Heritage Museum on Saturday, December 7, 2019, from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I would accept a motion to approve the request of the Hingham Downtown Association to close Main Street between Elm and North Streets and South Street between Central and North Streets and to use the sidewalks and tunnel cap for Christmas in the Square on Friday, December 6, 2019, from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can't really vote against Christmas. In this I morning. know. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Reports. Nothing on my end. Thank you. I did. You said you did. Let's go find it. So, um, just so uh, I'm not sure if everyone understands this, but whenever we have these large storms, whether they're uh, flood-related storms or more most often winter storms. Um, that that uh, the town incurs significant cost on. Often FEMA will declare disaster zones nationally, and then you end up with a scenario where, when you ta when you track your expenses locally appropriately, you can um, receive reimbursements for those expenses through the uh, federal government. 
And because of the, eff the efforts of both uh, Chief Olson and Chief Murphy, as well as Superintendent Sylvester, um, we've recently received FEMA reimbursements to the tune of uh, $92,800 for debris cleanup, $19,900 for boat ramp repairs and uh, Bathing Beach parking lot repairs, and $13,260 for damage to the schools. So, um, again, Fantastic. You know, <laughs> a, yeah, part, a big part money. of what Selectman yeah. Power is talking about is trying to find money outside of the Hingham tax base to offset our operations, and, uh, and this is the kind of effort that happens on a regular basis. So, Well done. Joe? Couple issues, um, topics. The first is compressor station. Um, I've received communications. I think other members of the board have received it. Town officials have received it. So I want to do two things. First, give an update on where the lit that litigation stands, and then also talk about some notices. Uh, last week, on October 22nd, uh, the town of Hingham joined with the town of Weymouth and the cities of Braintree and Quincy in seeking a review of the decision of the Mass Department of Environmental Protection to issue a permit for the proposed compressor, compressor station in Weymouth on Route 3A. The petition was filed in the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit under the Federal Natural Gas Act, which gives the U.S. Court of Appeals original and exclusive jurisdiction to review the DEP's decision. Uh, the petition mainly concerns emissions from the proposed uh, compressor station of nitrogen oxides and formaldehyde. Um, there are three issues raised. I don't want to go into them in re uh, excruciating depth. The first issue was whether or not uh, a motor, an electric motor, should have been considered as an option. Uh, the second issue uh, concerned uh, selective catalytic reduction. Um, whether or not that should have been added to the turbine in order to uh, reduce uh, uh, NOx em emissions, uh, that's um, uh, nitrogen oxide emissions. And the third issue uh, concerns uh, levels of formaldehyde. Those are the three issues that have been appealed uh, to the First Circuit. Uh, the schedule is that the DEP uh, is expected to be filing their brief December 11th, then Algonquin, uh, files their opening brief on December 18th. Reply briefs are filed in January. No hearing date has been set, although this is on an expedited, expedited uh, scheduling basis with the court. And it looks as if the court will be acting sometime uh, in the spring, uh, although that date is certainly not uh, set in stone. So we'll certainly keep the public updated as we get information. Uh, second, we've, I've heard communications and questions from members of the public about discharges from the existing facility. Uh, just to be clear, those discharges are from the existing facility, so they're not subject to the proposed permits for the proposed facility. Uh, so I think people were thinking that limitations that might have applied in what's being proposed applied to the existing. They do not. Uh, second, it's been my understanding that Algonquin has been providing notice to the abutting communities, and Hingham is not an abutting community uh, uh, with respect to where the discharges have been taking place, uh, although I believe you can contact Algonquin on their website to request uh, that you be notified. So that's, that's my update there with respect to the compressor station. Um, Second, uh, there is a meeting scheduled tomorrow, October 30th, with the Council on Aging. It is an open house. Members of the public are invited to attend. Members of the Board of Selectmen will be attending. Um, and it's really going to be our chance uh, to communicate with those people who are using the Senior Center about their needs and for them to learn about the what's going on in the town. So I would encourage uh, members of the public who are interested to attend. Uh, next, uh, uh, Mary and I attended, and Karen wanted to, but did not, could not attend, Phyllis Chapman's 102nd birthday celebration today. Uh, it was incredible. It was uplifting. And we are all looking forward to celebrating her 103rd birthday next year. What was, um, the, what was the theme this year? Last year it was 101 Dalmatians. Was <laughs> uh, Phyllis is a sweetheart. So there was a sweetheart tree yes. and <laughs> very nice hearts and 
Fantastic. It was, and it was very well attended. Um, and then I don't know if anyone else is going to cover the um, the master plan schedule for um, when they're going to be having their meetings. Uh, we somebody I was going to but go, sure, go ahead. No, you're you're on a roll. So mom, I'm on a roll. So uh, the master plan committee is going to be having vision visioning events, and members of the public are encouraged to attend. They are Monday, November 18th, from 10 a.m. to noon. Wednesday, November 20th, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And Saturday, November 23rd, from 11.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. All of those are on the second floor of Town Hall. Um, and the same material will be covered at each of those events, so you really need only attend one of those. And they're, they're really meant to be small discussion groups, so you'll be able to come and share your thoughts about what you like about town, town, what you not so wild what you like about, to improve, about town. change. Yeah. So, um, yep. you know, like we talked about tonight, we're all in this together, and um, you know, I, the master planning group is working really hard to um, to undertake these outreach efforts. So we really encourage you to to attend. And then with respect to the November 18th uh, session that's from 10 a.m. to 12, I do want to say that there is babysitting available um, for a small fee here at Town Hall. Mary. A um, couple things. I just, just to build on what Joe mentioned about Phyllis Chapman, it, it gets back to the Senior Center. And, you know, Karen, you know this, but Phyllis is part of an exercise group at the Senior Center, and this is a group of about 40 or 50 women. And this is, you know, this is about... It's about wellness, it's about community, it's about friendship, and this is a group that takes care of one another. And they're, as someone said to me today, we are each other's family. And when I think of the Senior Center, that's really what it's all about. It's about building community and a place where, um, uh, just a, a place to cultivate that. And um, it, it, it reinforced to me just the, the the real mission of the senior center in so many different ways is is nurturing you know the minds the hearts and the bodies of of such a big part of our population um, getting to the younger scale um, I do just want to mention that um, every Hingham High School sports team from the fall are making the playoffs That's this year crazy yeah. and you know girls soccer got a tie last night and they're you know, they're in, uh, just all the teams are in, and um, so our, our congratulations. And, and lastly, just a kind of a quick water update, because I think sometimes there's a lot of things that are going on, but, but we get questions. So um, just so people know, uh, you know, we are still in the good husbandry period where Aquarian is operating the water system. Uh, we envision that, as Tom went through this a few weeks ago, uh, at one of our meetings, this the schedule calls for the town assuming ownership no earlier than March 1st, and that's just because this is a complex transaction. Um, Eversource, Aquarian, Town of Hingham, we're all working cooperatively, but we all want to make sure that we do our due diligence. Uh, the request for proposal for a water system operator is out. Um, Tom and Michelle were part of the site visit that took place a few weeks ago. So that continues to move along. And also, you know, when, when the financial model was put together, and, and all the while we've, we've been talking about this, the town has always consistently said that if, if town meeting voted to authorize this, we're going to bring in some expertise to help us with this transition. This transition is not something that we can do alone. So again, in a, in a public process, the town has hired uh, environmental partners group to provide technical expertise. Mr. Jeffrey Nutting, a 40-year town administrator who is helping with a lot of the municipal aspects of all of the necessary requirements. It's a, it's a business plan with the Department of Environmental Protection. It's the creation of rules and regulations. The town also continues to benefit from the guidance of, of Mr. Robert Gollage, former DEP commissioner. So, you know, what, what we're really doing here is bringing the necessary technical and specialist resources to bear to make sure that this transition is smooth for all concerned. The Transition and Evaluation Committee is meeting every couple weeks. They just met last night. 
All of their meetings are being taped. They are being broadcast. These are public meetings. They are being posted in Hull and Cohasset. So as we continue to move along, uh, there, is, there's a, there are a lot of different parts of this uh, that, that are going. And um, again, the, the DEP and, and the word that we continue to get from them is they, they feel like this is moving in an appropriate direction at an appropriate pace. So, um, you know, as in the weeks to come, there will be more updates with respect to the RFP. Um, again, the T&E committee is, is meeting to review things, and um, uh, it just continues to move along. Great. Anything else? Okay. I, I have one uh, follow-up um, hearing the discussion about Phyllis Chapman and the group of women who are exercising. Uh, I didn't realize it was only women um, so if there are guys out there who are not exercising <laughs> get over there <laughs> okay. Uh, okay and on that note um, I will convene I'd like to convene an executive session for review approval and potential release of prior executive session minutes pursuant to Massachusetts general law chapter 30a section 22 and 21a 7 uh, the board will not return to open session this requires a roll roll call vote Mary aye Aye. Aye. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night.